All right. Uh, well, I am happy with Kale and very disappointed with everybody besides Kale uh, that, uh, that, that he's the only one who is his his you know acting appropriately here. Uh, I <laughs> I have a question, Ben. Actually, as we as we get started. Um, as, as someone who celebrated a number of birthdays with you, um, how drunk are you by this point? Oh, not that much. Okay. Just curious. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but, but Carol was holding up a glass of whiskey. So right. well, we've got to do something about that then. Yeah. Cheers. Right. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Happy birthday. Burgess. <laughs> thank, thank you, Carol. Mm. So, um, joined, uh, by, uh, J. Andrew World, our uh, graphic designer for GTA, who, um, well, which I might have just added some A's to, thus belying what I just told Ryan. But, uh, <laughs> very well, uh, I'm adding A's tonight anyway, so, you know. <laughs> hey! Hey! hey. hey. Uh, um, I think he's going to, you know, he was excited in a sort of nerdish way. He wanted to say some stuff about color theory, uh, joined... Uh, as uh, as usual for this movie streams by uh, philosophy professor uh, Ryan Lake, uh, who um, is uh, you know is somebody I you know often see on my birthday, usually not in this uh, this form. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, by uh, David uh, David Griscom of of Left Reckoning, uh, joining us from his uh, his natural habitat in Texas. <laughs> Beautiful uh, day here. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, by uh, Kale Brooks, the YouTube producer uh, from Jacobin, uh, who is uh, is normally um, like normally can't join us for uh, for movie things because he has to produce the Jacobin show on Wednesday nights. But this is the uh, this is the you know night he could get off. Kale is entirely too excited about talking about The Shining, so uh, you'll you'll be hearing uh, a lot from him uh, this uh, this evening. I uh, was almost not going to do this because, as was previously mentioned, this is my uh, it's my forty first birthday. I'm very old, uh, and um, you know the. But I decided that uh, that you know having a couple of drinks with uh, with good friends and talking about one of my favorite you know movies seemed like a reasonable thing to do about it. And also, I uh, believe I'm joined by our producer Forrest. Are you there, Forrest? Forrest, not here, Mister <laughs> Burgess. <laughs> <laughs> it's so ridiculous and degraded that I can make Forrest do that. Uh, <laughs> you want to you want to hear like a, a crazy story about um when so my grandpa bought this house in Maine that was like this really old house and uh, I guess the the kids of whoever sold it to him didn't want him to sell it so it was in the eighties like right after The Shining came out and they wrote Red Rum like all over like in crayon all over the fucking house and like the bathrooms and stuff so that when they came in to look at the house like it said red ram red ram all over everything <laughs> well um fair enough uh so i am uh, i'm actually going to uh to just sort of um let uh, you know. Let Forrest uh, take us through the uh, the plot, and uh, and let Kale do. I'm guessing most of the talking, and mm -hmm. um, uh, we we are going to be joined, I should say, by Anna Kasparian in like a little over an hour uh, when she she gets off of her her regular uh, you know Wednesday duties at uh, TYT. Um, but this doesn't take priority. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little upset about that. You know, I, yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if like. Who's the correct person to have a word with about that? If yeah. you know, <laughs> it's just not yeah. getting it, you know, or, or or who's, you know, like like who's like who's making this extremely unreasonable decision? You've got to you've got to give Jenka a, a good thought experiment about it and uh, <laughs> correcting. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that that I was I was going to eat some Turkish babies. This is, this is not, I don't know why you're getting upset. This is just a thought experiment. Look, if you were a philosopher, if you were a philosopher, you'd understand that eating babies is a regular thing that we talk about. It's in the, uh, it's in the, the, the philosophy guide um, that I purchased yeah, yeah. for $2. Yeah, it's a point point. Encyclopedia of philosophy entry on work schedules. Uh, this, this is all, uh, these, 
these are all extremely silly callbacks to the uh, Sam Harris episode we did <laughs> on, uh, on on Monday. Uh, so Sam Harris is wrong about everything. Has he <laughs> trash just yet? Uh, not that I know of. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Right. Um, I think that Ben Burgess was extremely unfair to me. And <laughs> if he had listened to 45 minutes of my most recent lecture, he'd understand that, you know, what I was really saying when I was saying thought experiments was deeply philosophical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Apparently. Uh, so Ryan was telling us on that episode that, uh, that, that Sam has taken to saying that, all of his views, you understand the truth of them if you meditate enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. And I forgot yeah. to I forgot to mention that he also says that he has experiences like Jesus. He has yeah. transcendent experiences like Jesus. Um, he literally says this. He's getting podcast. very powerful, man. Yeah, yeah. I was getting. Worked. I was curious if he was still because I hadn't seen anything from him for, for a little while, so I was yeah. worried. Well, he left yeah. to meditate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. He's just been gaining more and more strength. Yeah, he's out walking on water right now. <laughs> <laughs> the moral the moral landscape allows me to quite literally walk on water. And you would understand this if your mind was as powerful as mine is. You know, you know that's how I ended up getting to be buddies with Michael. Was I got like a meeting with Michael to get coffee one day um, with, through a mutual friend of ours, Luke Mavo, who's my professor at university. And uh, we were just hanging out and I brought up how I felt really bad for my philosophy professor, my senior year, because all of these students started using Sam Harris, like uh, as like the basis for their text. And I just felt like it must be so exhausting as a professor, because if you open it up and you say that you can use any philosopher, mm -hmm. right, it's hard to come and throw the hammer down later. But it'd be really exhausting to have spent years and years and years doing like the philosophy of mind and have a bunch of, you know, 21 22 year olds talk about like well this guy sam harris really has it yeah. all figured out <laughs> oh god but anyways our michael and i's mutual hatred of sam harris was the <laughs> was the steel that built like a long-term yeah. friendship yeah that brings people together <laughs> yeah i really i wish he was here to to listen to the that meditation episode of sam harris the, the nine minute like explanation about you know because I feel like his take on that would be hilarious. Yeah. I was I was rewatching I was rewatching the thing that um that he did w the, when the Ezra Klein thing happened and uh he he said like the the only person that's ever brought him to feel like me maybe meditation is a scam was Sam Harris because uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> which, yeah um which is uh yeah which is which is particularly funny you know since he he could go on. Uh, on meditation retreats he actually was uh briefly a meditation teacher and actually the uh, funniest detail about this is that he apparently had a, a meditation teacher in common with sam harris <laughs> but, uh, yeah Terrible. if anything's gonna make you question that uh that would be uh that would be it anyway um what do you suppose if you meditated as much as sam harris uh, how do you think you would interpret the uh, the shining? Is is this a uh, great a transition? Movie? I love it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> is there a moon landing thing going on there? You know what's the what's the situation? It's a movie about uh, <laughs> captured women fighting against the cruel oppression of Yankee men and finally <laughs> freeing themselves. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's about white man's burden. How's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. my credit in here, Lloyd? <laughs> white man's burden, Lloyd. <laughs> um, although, uh, although honestly, what uh, Jack's thoughts about race in the movie aren't nearly as problematic as Delbert Grady. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> well, Delbert Grady is a man of his time. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Although what time he's in is a little ambiguous, but mm -hmm. I am uh, I'm jumping ahead. Nineteen uh, nineteen seventy for the supposedly the the caretaker that axe murders his family, but I don't know about the. That's Charles Grady. Yeah, but there's like there's it's supposed to be like a mirror thing going on, right? Like it's like they're it's unclear. Yeah. That's... Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, let's well, let's go through it. It's not clear because because Jack has always been the caretaker. And Delbert has always been the butler. Right. So, you know, anyway. Um, this, <laughs> for us, start us, uh, start us up. Tell us about The Shining. 
All right, so it starts off, and we're going through this um, this this beautiful scenic mountain overlook in the in the Colorado mountains, and uh, and and Jack's driving up to the to the Overlook Hotel. Um, he seems to be struggling quite a bit finding work. He's taking a lot of odd jobs, and he gets this interview for um, to become the caretaker at the Overlook Hotel. And he's really he's really trying hard throughout that interview to like impress or like seem i guess nonchalant about his uh his feelings about having to go into isolation isolation for five months and write um you know during this during this period where the hotel is going to be closed and during during this interview Stuart Ullman, who's the um current i guess manager of the hotel starts telling him that in 1970 which i i i'm not i'm not clear if the movie's supposed to take place in 1980 like when when it actually releases but um so like about 10 years ago, there was this like horrible murder that had happened when the caretaker went into isolation for a few months and killed his wife and his daughters and then blew his brains out. He killed them with an ax and then blew his brains out, which is an important detail. Um, so I don't know. Any <laughs> any uh, any thoughts about well, the first scene? Well, before before we even get to that, I I'd, I'd want to make note because I, I sent you that photo of the, of the yellow uh, VW Beetle because... Uh, what it's supposed to yeah there it is so the the idea behind it is that the in the book the shining written by stephen king the beetle that jack drives up to the overlook in is a red beetle and kubrick intentionally changes it to yellow and then later on in the movie you actually do see a red beetle uh except that that red beetle is uh completely destroyed under a semi truck and so it's understood more or less that this is supposed to be an indication both to Stephen King and, and people familiar with the book that this is not Stephen King's The Shining. This is Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. And there's going to be a number of important differences uh, that Kubrick changes, uh, so much so that Stephen King notoriously hated the movie. Uh, that he still very he, still very much does. Yeah. That documentary um, that documentary about it dropped pretty uh, like a couple years ago room 237 or whatever, and Stephen King completely trashed it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I mean, kind of rightly for the documentary, but uh, but I think that... Uh, but I, I, it is crazy that Stephen King hates this movie since, like, I'm, you know, I'm kind of a Stephen King apologist. I really like a lot of those novels, <laughs> but, um, but I... But, like, he... All of the god-awful adaptations of his books that he seems mm -hmm. to be fine with... And like the one that's like actually an immortal classic, you know, he, uh, you know, he has like a huge problem with. Mm -hmm. Well, part of that is that the uh, in The Shining, it's it's supposed to be a version of himself that it's somewhat autobiographical. That he was uh, as a writer, he went to a hotel, uh, kind of around the time that it was closing for the season. Um, I believe it was the Stanley Hotel in Colorado. And it was that mixed with his own somewhat confused and somewhat violent feelings towards his children at the time that as a young father being deeply frustrated when his parent, when his children wouldn't listen to him, uh, for instance. And so a lot of it, I think, has to do with his hatred of the casting of Jack Nicholson as the person who's supposed to be him, because mm -hmm. uh, St uh, Stephen King would have wanted somewhat more of like an every guy kind of actor and uh and jack uh nicholson from the very beginning is uh already not quite an every guy kind of character yeah i i, and I see somebody in the chat saying uh king is a lib which he certainly is but i, I like many artists and musicians and writers uh filmmakers uh who are libs or worse right you know that's, that's, yeah well if you start canceling i mean you know if you start canceling all the libs that are involved in art and like novelizations as writers like, you know what i mean like who, who the fuck like there's a very small percentage of people that are left yeah, um, yeah exactly it, well, well the other interesting thing about king is uh most of his books uh you know tend to focus on a writer as a main character mm -hmm. and the irony is his son uh joe hill most of his books have the um is the child of an alcoholic artist yeah <laughs> so yeah it's like yeah you know. yeah right um 
uh, you know, there, there are certainly, yeah, there are variations, but I think everything Joe Hill does is in one way or another about Stephen King, uh, or, you know, or and Stephen everything Stephen King, King does is about himself. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <That's a family laughs> tradition. But, uh, but yeah, I, 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 as I remember the story, uh, so he had uh, his first book, Carrie, came out. Uh, which was which his wife Tabitha famously famously rescued from like the trash can. You know he was writing with the typewriter and he was like halfway through and he was sick of it. And you know uh, he had I think already published a couple of novels under his pen name Richard Bachman, uh, but they hadn't done that well. Uh, but she uh, she got him to to sort of take Carrie out and finish it and it ended up being especially after the uh, the movie came out a um, you know a bestseller. Uh, and and he could uh, I think he might have already written Salem's Lot at this point too, but anyway he had uh, but it was like very early in his career when they finally like had enough money that he could just kind of move wherever, and so they were traveling around a little bit and uh, and yeah he was at this hotel and this was while he was still very much in the throes of his alcoholism and so he was like like he was almost ready to close up for the season so it's like half deserted. And he was extremely drunk, sort of trying and failing to find his way back to their room. And so in combination with like a half an idea that he long had about a telepathic kid, you know, that's sort of what became The Shining. Yeah, that, it's, and it's interesting, though, what, what I was talking about before we went on, um, I guess during that same time period, he had spent a bunch of time at like and he still does like in, in New Paltz, the Mohawk Mountain House, which is I mean, the, the isolation is there, I think, but it doesn't obviously close for the season. It's kind of open year round. So, um, uh, like, so here, like in New Paltz, like in this area, there's like a, an, I guess, an urban legend or whatever that that was like a big part of the inspiration for um, King's version of the Overlook too. What are you gonna say, Kale? Oh, uh, I don't know. You can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All, All right. right. So. Yeah. You, I mean, you, you put up in this. Uh, so that's Stuart Ullman, the the guy that he's in the um the meeting with that that tells him about the uh the grisly murder that took place there. You know, just assumably just a decade ago, which, um, you know, and and, and Jack plays it off like very very calm. He's like, oh, my wife loves ghost stories. Like, you know, she'll be that's intrigued by this ghost story and horror movie addicts. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, just for, from this opening scene, Jack Nicholson, I can understand if you're Stephen King why you don't want that to be who's portraying your semi-autobiographical character. But I mean, he's just like, I mean, even in the interview, he's like oozing this kind of contempt and just like in every line that's like smarmy, smiley contempt for everything. It's just like, it's amazing. Just absolutely an amazing performance. Yeah, and I, and I should say too, uh, in the movie, they don't really give you a, any sense of how he got this job. Uh, which might, you know, which might even be a good artistic choice because I think it, it, you know, sort of reinforces the idea that he's just sort of being sucked in by the hotel, mm -hmm. you know, to, to play yes. that role or replay. Yeah, they, it, you know, he said someone from Denver referred him or something, but that's that's all we get. Yeah, yeah. So in the um, in the novel, they have a little bit more backstory there mm -hmm. that there's somebody who's like the main owner or at least like a major like shareholder, you know, in, in the hotel or the company that owns it, uh, who was like a drinking buddy of his back in Denver. Uh, you know, he was also like on the school board, I think, you know, where when he was a school teacher uh, and they'd, uh, and I think if I'm remembering it right, there's even a suggestion that like while they were out drinking, they had some like really grisly like accident where like they they think that they might have hit a kid on his bike or something but they were never quite <laughs> sure, you know, uh, and, classic uh, stephen king <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's just doing research for the next book it's, it's just new material <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely a, a bit where like stephen king tries like heroin under a bridge or something in order to write a <laughs> to, to write a horror story about it <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. So, um, and then like it's uh, anyway. So like that, there's there's a whole little plot line around this. In this case, they just say uh, our people in Denver recommended to you, and that's it. Uh, but I think what's in common with the novel and the movie is that he uh, he seems pretty unhappy about having mm -hmm. to to do this, even though he is trying to get this new career as a writer going. Like you know, he kind of resents being put in this like subservient position. Where he has to suck up to these people to uh, to get the job as the caretaker, yeah. and, and you like can he... yeah oh. go ahead. 
it almost means like he doesn't have a choice in the matter too. Like, like uh, yeah. his life is kind of falling apart and there's some, uh, there, there's some things that kind of hint towards other stuff as, as we get into the movie um, uh, about, you know, abuse and alcoholism uh, yeah. that, that they, they don't actually, you know, directly say anything about, but they kind of, you know, they, 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 they hint around the edges as, as you watch the film. Yeah. All throughout it. Um, yeah. But there's, there's definitely like, I, at first, you know, I, I don't think that you register the contempt that he has for, for this position, but when he gets on the phone with Wendy and um, she's like, Oh, did you get the job? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever. Like, he's like, listen, like I, we're going to have to move up here. Like that, that scene, I think you kind of really accurately, like, kind of like the smarminess is gone and like kind of just like the cold abusive like mm -hmm. husband role is back um mm -hmm. in the forefront so, yeah i, I, I mean I you know, have... to that that abusiveness i think in that first scene or no it's not the first scene it's a little bit later so i'll, I'll hold off on it but um right. but i i think that um but yeah like there's a good there's a good scene in the uh, the novel where he like like there's a little bit of it that i've always thought like like stephen king can sometimes do these things very well uh, that I always thought was like almost read like a Raymond Carver short story or something where uh, he's uh, he's going out to uh, to try to get the uh, the snow cap going uh, because like some weird things have already happened and Wendy wants to leave and he's not too far gone yet and uh, he's out there and he just like there's just like five pages of him standing there by the snow cap and thinking about like what his life is going to be like if they leave and he breaks his contracts and you know they're gonna like have to go into like the nearest town. And he's gonna get some like shitty menial job, and you know, and and before he knows it, he's gonna start drinking again. And then like he takes out the battery and shoves it in the snow, which at least at that point in the book is like very clearly just like of his own free will because he can't, mm -hmm. you know, he can't stand the idea of mm -hmm. uh, of doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, again, you know, it's, they don't spend as much time on all that in the movie, but I think you can, I think you can see it there. Yeah, right. And well, is that, is, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Kale. Sorry. Because he he doesn't uh, he doesn't want to. He has no interest in fulfilling the actual role of being uh, the caretaker for the the hotel for the winter. All he cares about is writing his his book, basically. And mm -hmm. in fact, this is like if there's anything that Jack cares about, uh, like, and he is an extremely a uh, self-centered person, as we're going to get into. I mean, oh, yeah. the one thing that he cares about is actually writing something. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, to the expense of everyone else. He he has contempt for his family. He has contempt for. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, we'll get into it, but uh, you know, and what ends up happening is that he doesn't even he doesn't even take care of the the hotel by the you know throughout it. It's uh, yeah. that Wendy <laughs> ends up yeah, becoming relegated to taking. Yeah. Yeah. And in the in the book, that's way more apparent, right? Um, I think I read the book a really long time ago as like a teenager, but the book it's a lot more apparent that he's not even like oh, not you, even. You read, the, the, uh, you read the book two years ago for us. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think we established last time that at least I'm a little bit older than Kale. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All Nan right. Nando was Nando was giving was giving me shit about it. When <laughs> was Nando's giving everybody shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> get some forensics on that yeah um no i so i think that um ah oh, fuck i totally i totally forgot oh so yeah so like he like throughout the the book it becomes a lot more apparent i think that he doesn't even want to fulfill that role as a caretaker mm -hmm. whatsoever right um yeah but certainly the movie you never see him actually checking on anything you only see Wendy no. yeah you see yeah, you have yeah. long scenes of Wendy well, going around doing doing all the work <laughs> yeah yeah and and he doesn't want to be a caretaker in both senses of the word mm -hmm. that's kind right. of because right, 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 right. ultimately yeah. so there there is the as we'll get into this i mean there is the horror story side of like there's um and and this is i think something worth kind of going into to what extent is this a ghost story to what extent is this paranormal or um supernatural and then on the other hand uh it's a family that uh is pretty fucked up um mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh and so so on that you know he doesn't really fulfill the role of father at throughout the movie um one thing actually worth noting i don't have a photo of it i didn't send this to forrest but on the desk in allman's office uh which we haven't even mentioned that Ullman is, 
it basically is supposed to look like a president that like he has the John F. Kennedy haircut. He has the American flag. He has an eagle behind him. He's got the desk. Um, but on his office, completely out of place uh, is Carl Jung's uh, Red Book. No. <laughs> if you can kind of see it in the corner in the photo that I sent Forrest. Um, but it, it's not, you can see it in the reverse shot, the, the spine of the book, the Red Book down there. Um, mm. In the, in the uh, reverse over the shoulder of Allman, you can see that it's Carl Jung's book, which this is something that Kubrick has done in a number of his films. If you go to um, Clockwork Orange, for instance, there's a number of uh, book titles that are visible throughout it that are uh, thematically important. Mm. And so this being basically the first real scene of characters, it's already setting up that, uh, you know, yes, these are characters and yes, this is a story, but there's certain archetypes that are about to play out. Um, oh, you got to you got to get the the Jungian archetypes over there. <laughs> <laughs> the only the only rule over here, the overlook, is that you you know you you really you really have to get the hierarchy going like the like the lobsters. <laughs> there are there are a lot of lobster uh, hierarchies in this movie. <laughs> Delbert Grady talking to him in the bathroom, and he's like, "Sir, consider the lobster." <laughs> Why do you think the bathroom just... is red? <laughs> Jack has a uh, he has uh, that voice the entire time. <laughs> just, the whole movie is just Jordan Peterson's like Benzo, like Benzo fucking like like trip into hell, and he's just stuck at this fucking hotel in like Toronto. <laughs> 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 I feel like we already did this bit with Kate Fear, but fuck it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, there are a lot of characters in a lot of movies who who are funny as Jordan Peterson, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> let's. Uh, all right. So, uh, so Jack's done his initial interview. Then, uh, then where are we? All right. So then we we switch to Jack's house, I guess. Um, and his son, his son is like uh, standing in the bathroom brushing his teeth, and ends up having this like seizure. Um, where he where he imagines like the blood pouring out of the elevator that comes up a bunch of times throughout the movie, which suppose I think I mean I don't know I always read it as like it's supposed to be the the blood filling the the hotel after those murders took place, but I don't I don't know if it's really that I mean literal, um, but so he's having this premonition and that's the first time we really find out like his son kind of has this um has this power, I mean. Right. Well, but Jack doesn't. We, no one. Uh, I mean, people know that the parents know that uh, Danny talks to someone named Tony. And after uh, after Danny blacks out, um, he's standing. I think there's a photo of this. He's standing uh, in the bathroom looking at a mirror and he's asking uh, Tony to tell him uh, what's about to come that. uh Tony speaks in a different voice. It's a little bit more scratchy. And uh, as he's about to explain, it's the little boy that lives in his mouth, which um, again, for Freudians out there, this movie is so rich, <laughs> but um, yeah, exactly. So he's standing over and this is a shot. This is a composition that you see throughout the movie several times that Kubrick is constantly framing people through doorways, looking into either bathrooms or bedrooms, mm -hmm. um, which I think is thematically important because there's certain scenes that you should associate with one another. And so Danny standing in the bathroom, leaning over the edge, looking at himself, uh, presumably maybe brushing his teeth or something. Um, Danny now telling, or, or Tony now telling him that something bad is gonna come, that Jack has already gotten the job. Uh, and yeah, seeing these horrible visions and then blacking out, and uh, and then we return once uh, there is a child uh, psychologist or therapist uh, uh, approaching him, trying to ask him some questions to see if he's OK. Um, I think there's also a photo of that, too, because all of these shots are really strange. Like, yeah, and again, this is a we, theme that I'm just going to say before we move on, I just uh, there's something I did want to go, go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to talk about that photo for a second whenever you're done. Oh, yeah. No, just the. The, the way that the family is framed, the way that people are framed in, in apartments, in what's considered their homes or, or you know, so this the, their apartment in, in Boulder or, or when they go to the Overlook, um, it's important. Uh, it, it's, it's important because of just kind of how 
strange and unnerving it is because this is a deeply disturbed family as, as we're going to talk about. Yeah. And first of all, notice that the walls are white in their house, um, I, I, which is not going to be true later on, but it's a neutral color. And the bathroom is one of the few examples you can see uh, complementary colors actually in frame uh, with the green at the top and the, uh, the pink. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, complementary colors and stuff like that later, but I just wanted to kind of point that out and also notice how it's only like uh, mostly primary colors you're seeing. You're seeing blues, you're seeing reds, you're seeing yellows and very little of uh, anything else. Hmm. And, uh, and actually that kind of changes as the movie goes on, but I'll, we'll, we'll save that for a little bit later. There's also the um, there's also the the dopey sticker and the the mini mouse and it's interesting. I think Kubrick does that a lot because we watched uh, Full Metal Jacket and they had them singing the the Minnie Mouse Clubhouse song or the Mickey Mouse Clubhouse song um, at the end of it. So kind of Kubrick always uses like Disney characters, I think, and I mean in this case Peanuts characters too. But to like to to show like childhood innocence. Um, yeah, and- actually, if I'm remembering right, I feel like in Full Metal Jacket in the like. Um- the military journalism office uh there was some like peanuts imagery in there like there was there was some there was some like there was definitely some stuff along those lines those lines yeah. and I misremembering that detail but it's, it's right. it is i mean it's very interesting because like there's the whole idea of like disney coca-cola like images like that kind of like corporate imagery i guess in in the the 70s and, and 80s especially like really representing like a like a that had had way more, I think, representation than we do it now. You know, like we're we're kind of a lot more subversive about our imagery, but and which which I mean is the point of this in all of these movies too. But like it's interesting that it's kind of those straightforward like character and and commercialized shots. Um, mm-hmm. There's also there's something it's a it's a pretty obvious thematic device. So the use of of Mickey Mouse when you see a Mickey Mouse and identifying when else you've seen Mickey Mouse throughout the the movie. Same thing happens actually with Winnie the Pooh in this movie. That there's multiple Winnie the Pooh uh, moments and and again you wouldn't want to just base you know a, a you know analysis of of a movie like this just on like oh well there's a Winnie the Pooh there there's a Winnie the Pooh there that's you know make the connection. But it does add additional kind of thematic linkages to say, yes, you're right to think that there are themes that are going on throughout this movie. Like when you see particular props that are being used reoccurring, which by the way, this I'm is a, probably the most overanalyzed movie in, in, of all time. Yeah, like, saying, yeah. it's, 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 like, like I like the way that you said that, like it made it sound like, oh, this was like covered in great depth in the uh, the Shining study group you did with Vivek Chibber, you know, that like they had, you know, they, 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 <laughs> The witty the poo imagery and what that means. <laughs> I it's do you, do you remember what you payoff. called the do you remember what you called the uh the therapist image? I'm trying to pull that up, but I'm not sure um which yeah. one it is on the list. Um I think it's Danny Bear. Um <laughs> uh because because okay, so wait, because there's a couple of them. Um so because there's Danny looking in the uh, the bath. You know, there's Danny therapist. That's the one it is. Um, All right, hold on. There's a shot and there's a reverse shot. There's Danny now uh, after this episode is laying uh, in his bed. The therapist looking over him. Wendy also looking over him. Um, his room is full of animal I- imagery. Uh, there's a funny little. There's a goofy toy that is wearing the exact same outfit as Wendy, um, which is kind of a you know, an interesting choice to be like, yeah, this is kind of a, um, maybe a, I don't want to say an unserious character, but the, as you, as you kind of learn more about the family, um, she's not, uh, she's not taking things maybe as seriously as, as she could be, um, Mm -hmm. that there's, uh, and you even see this in the scene where the therapist is asking Danny questions like, um, what do you remember? Uh, she asks questions that, uh, a therapist would ask if they're trying to understand if there's a pattern of um, something like this happening before, if there's if there's some kind of trauma, some kind of abuse. She asks, um, uh, she asks about Tony, um, and Danny says, that's the little boy that lives in my mouth. And Wendy uh, interjects, oh, that's just this imaginary uh, friend, basically. Um, and, and the therapist asks, does Tony ever tell you to do things? And Danny says, uh, I don't want to talk about Tony right now. Um, and so y- we start to kind of get the dynamic between Wendy and Danny, but also importantly, the dynamic between 
Wendy and Jack, uh, just kind of through how they, uh, how Wendy talks about uh, uh, Danny. And um, the other, the other uh, image that I sent you, Forest is the reverse shot of, of Jack or not Jack of Danny sitting on the pillow pet and um, sitting on a big bear and and again you can there's certain thematic devices that kind of start emerging of of when do you recognize when do you see bears in the scene that bears kind of end up uh, having a relationship to uh, to uh, Danny that um, certain associations. Is it, is it this one? Um, no, that's later. <laughs> okay. There's a bunch of but bear there's bears. bears. There's, a lot, there's a lot of bears in this movie. Also, since we got a lull here, just point out again, uh, notice that uh, uh, she's wearing uh, uh, blue and red, which are, again, primary colors, because that's... That that's the big thing you'll notice is is uh, the Overlook Hotel is very much just primary colors. You know, Gold Room more or less is yellow. You know, the hallways are red or blue, um, and, and so like uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, moments where you see this this um, uh, uh, if it's like a warm room, uh, you know, uh, Danny's going to be wearing more cool colors. Uh, if it's a cool room, Danny will be wearing more warm colors. They also, Danny and, and Wendy wear red and blue for almost the entire first hour of the film that uh, you start to get this association of, of uh, red on blue, um, which becomes important later uh, in, a, in a certain hallway vision. But um, yeah, so in this conversation with the, uh, the, the child therapist, uh, we get uh, some of the backstory about the the family uh, that um, you know Wendy uh, is doing this this very like nervous codependent thing where you know where, where she's uh, she's she's you know very concerned that Jack doesn't come off too badly uh, in this uh, the story uh, that um, that when Jack was a teacher when they were still in um, so this would be Vermont. Friday. Yeah, they're still in Vermont. Um, there was a day when Jack was out drinking and he came home angry and uh, Danny had scattered his uh, a lot of his papers around the floor and Jack had like tried, you know, reached out his hand to yank him up uh, and uh, dislocated his shoulder uh, so that uh, Danny actually had to be kept out of school for a while. Uh, and, and I think this is one of the, not just in that story, but in the way she tells the story that you get some sense of the uh, abusiveness uh, that uh, like, like I, I don't know, maybe I'm reading too much into this, but uh, when Wendy is trying to give the story a happy ending, she said, well, Jack said, um, you know, if I ever touch another drop, uh, you can mm -hmm. divorce me. Uh, and he hasn't, you know, hasn't since then. And like, the phrasing sounded a little bit funny there. Like, 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 you know, like under those circumstances, I'll like, let you leave me. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And also she says, and he has it in five months, which, you know, I mean, a lot of times when people tell the story and they're like, well, you know, they have it in like a couple of years or something like later, Jack makes it seem like it was like three years ago. Like the timing is a little bit different. Like he says that he hurt, he hurt Danny three years ago when he's talking later. And she says it's been five months. That he hasn't had a drink. So mm -hmm. kind of there's like an implication that maybe like something else has happened in between those two things or he heard him, him more than once. Like in, yeah, under it seems like, clear at least he didn't stop drinking when he hurt Danny. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and Wendy in the scene is just she's trembling. She lights a cigarette and you can see the uh, yeah. the, the lighter in her hand uh, shaking that yeah. when, when, when the therapist asks her, um, you know, because uh, because she doesn't she doesn't come out right forthright with the information that uh that jack has has hurt danny that it's it's yeah. kind of the therapist pulls it out of her over a series of questions asking um when did tony come about oh uh did danny uh fit in well in school um oh wait you had to take him out why did you have to take him out of school oh uh you know and then it gets to, to wendy finally saying it's just one of those things that happens a million times 
And it's it's total cover up for, because, uh, well, you know, we'll get into that. But I mean, she's totally covering for the actual violence that is occurring in the family at this point. And Jack does that too later in the, the movie, the same phrasing. He's like, he's like, it could have happened to anyone. It could have been a million times. And then slowly it gets drawn out of him by, I mean, someone who clearly possibly isn't even there. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it's just this inner madness, like talking to itself. But like his his understanding that like, oh, well, you know, I, I've never heard him. Like, all right, well, I've heard him once. Like, all right, well, you know, I heard him once. And then, uh, you know, but, but I never, I wouldn't do it again. And oh, it was an accident. It could have happened a million times. And it really is like this abusive. Um, I mean, I think I think the the eighties, like the seventies and eighties, are that time that you know uh, the abusive behavior. Like obviously, overt abuse from parents was always not. I mean, necessarily tolerated. Like you like putting your kids in the hospital, but there was that like a long time period where you were allowed to discipline your kids through physical punishment. And you know, it's kind of the awareness that like number one, that's really not fucking good. And number two, like the kind of social norms around it changing, I think. And the, so that this movie comes around at that time. And I think it also comes around the time kind of um, that like neoliberalism is starting and like the more precarious position of people. So that it's not just like, you kind of get like these, these like, you kind of get like these almost like pre Great Depression style drifting uh, people that kind of go from town to town and kind of have to escape from their past, mm -hmm. which I feel like there was a time of more economic security where that wasn't necessarily like the, the case for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so, so like, there's that feeling that like Jack is like a, you know, Jack wants to be a teacher and stuff happened and he's kind of now working odd jobs and it's kind of put it, it puts you in this precarious economic position where you, you like it, it worsens. I feel like all the emotional effects of all of the other mental illness and trauma kind of going through somebody. Um, so I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if that's necessarily an intentional, uh, you know, part of the movie, but it's interesting to kind of look at it through that lens, I think. Yeah. But, you know, I would just add to like regarding Wendy as they're like establishing the dynamic within the family, establishing that there is that bit of fear, like Kale was mentioning before. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, we don't know how deeply or where she she is of it, but it's definitely, you know, we can read those cues. Yeah. It matters a lot later um, when Jack makes his big shift, her ability to recognize the situation like that. Like there isn't a moment where she's sort of sitting down and being like, oh, man, I think he's super dangerous and crazy. Like she recognizes immediately and goes to that kind of defensive place. Right. Which means she all, always is seeing this threat. Um, and a lot of the early parts of the movie is sort of, I don't know, figuring yeah. out some way to continue her life um, and her child's life in some like level of like safety is like, I don't know. I mean, maybe you all have different opinions on this, but I don't think that Wendy is like unaware of the no, severity of her I situation. I think she's fully aware. Yeah. I mean, yeah. she, she, I mean, that's what's so great about her performance. Shelley yeah. Duvall, is like how in that first scene, before you ever see them in a scene together, like you, that dynamic is so clear and like she just exudes fear. Like when she's mm -hmm. talking to the psychologist, like, in you know, Jack's not even in the scene and she's still exuding fear. So it's clear that she's, um, yeah, I agree. She's totally aware of, of what Stanley of Kubrick was and he was yeah. abusing her. So, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, she's, that's probably <laughs> what we're actually seeing is her fear of Stanley Kubrick, but yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, so, so very famously, right. of course, Kubrick, uh, used the, uh, the same methods that, uh, that Kale uses to get good performances out of me and David for the quick takes. <laughs> uh, on, uh, on Jack and ben. You know, I have not yet submitted uh, one, our uh, quick take seven for the uh, the Guinness World Record of most takes for a single video. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, Kubrick's The Shining still has the record for most takes of a single scene with uh, the bat swinging scene that comes much later, That's but. Uh, <laughs> Had I submitted our quick take, um, I, I think we'd be in competition. I, I think uh, there's a chance we could dethrone The Shining. Join me, Ben. Kale is, really learning from, Kale is really learning from Kubrick, like, you know, the, the art of uh, constructive filmmaking. And abusing yeah. your, your actors. <laughs> They're great performances. You can't you can't argue with the performances. These are some of the yeah. best performances in, in movie history. Yeah, amazing. I mean, yeah, you have to physically and emotionally abuse people to get them, but <laughs> it's it's really yeah. interesting. Uh Shelley Duvall's 
interview there's like so kubrick's daughter made a, a making of the shining documentary like a 30 minute thing of just like footage that she had cut and um and it's like intercut with like interviews and stuff it was like a made for tv documentary and uh and and you know shelly duvall's kind of interview about her experience with kubrick sounds like somebody who's been abused like mm -hmm. she's like well you know like he he just kept on like you know really really just like like going at me and making me like do things again and, and really you know but you know it's a great performance and you know you really just have to do that to make the movie work like that justification for having to go through that abusive torment um he's normally a good guy he's always so nice to me <laughs> <laughs> look shitty guy great director great <laughs> <laughs> um yeah that's, uh -huh. that's, that's an interesting uh i don't know i i think that's an interesting uh like part of that of the of yeah the i mean i always i always uh remember uh oh. a ancient interview that i remember um reading in um uh something that in whenever this was the 90s early 2000s uh we called it a uh, magazine it was made out of paper like a book but it was, it was thinner uh that uh it was you guys just out. didn't read things on ipads back then no. <laughs> times times have changed yeah uh, <laughs> it was after uh eyes wide shut uh, had uh, had just come out, and uh, and it was an interview with with Nicole Kidman, and I remember there was a there was a uh, the interviewer asked her if uh, Stanley Kubrick was a misogynist, and she was like, "Well, look, I don't think he likes anybody." <laughs> <laughs> that was her defense of him that you know that he hates all human beings equally. The the thing that comes through in uh, Kubrick's daughter's kind of filming of it is like the charmed way that kind of almost like, I mean, Shelley Duvall calls it like sycophantic, like the sycophantic way, I guess that Jack Nicholson is treated because she's, he's like the superstar already because, you know, throughout the sixties and seventies, he's like new cinema's like golden child. You know what I mean? Like, and, but like, but while that's happening, like Shelley Duvall is getting literally fucking abused on set. So it's like this dichotomy of like everybody kind of going out of their way to cater to Jack Nicholson, who, I mean, is a brilliant actor, but like, you know, he's being treated like this, like this royal prince or something, and she's kind of just having the, you know, being abused the fuck out of. Now well, I haven't seen too many Jack Nicholson movies, but has does he always imitate uh, Christian Slater like that in his films? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, we do want to uh, uh, we do want to bring on Anna soon. She finished up at uh, at, at TYT, so uh, I know some of this is going to end up going out of order. But uh, but Andy, do you want to uh, uh, you know do you want to go through some of the uh, some of the color stuff from uh, from? Yeah, later? well, first of all, um, you know the first thing you actually notice in the movie is is the compositions of the uh, shots. You can see that from the helicopter shots to to just about every shot is uh, very symmetrical, and the symmetrical shots usually create stability. Um, however, uh, Kubrick, as a filmmaker, takes that and, and uh, like plays ominous music or just these long kind of eerie cuts where something's slowly building. Um, so, so it kind of throws off this weird, you know, the stability kind of throws you off. Uh, the other thing is, as I kept pointing out, is the um, the use of color with the uh, the primary colors because you know the walls are red uh, or blue for the most part in the uh, in the hotel, um, and they're muted in the apartment. If you notice, like the walls are pink and pastel blue and light yellow as you come in um and, and uh but then as you get into the hotel it's a lot, lot more intense uh color scheme uh and uh danny always is wearing the uh you know like if the, the the room is a warm color uh which is uh warm colors are uh red um orange and uh yellow um you know uh danny's going to be wearing a cool color or, or you're going to notice it more uh because like the the car he's driving has like the the blue seat that kind of hides his red um, uh, shirt. Uh, or you can see those dynamics going on with, with my mountain scene and uh, Griscom's mountain scene, you know, the more neutral colors. And then I have, you know, the red, the red tint and the red and blue tint to my, uh, to my mountain, mountain experience. Mm. <laughs> Very thoughtful, um, deliberate choice there. <laughs> but also once they arrive to the, uh, to the hotel, uh, Shelly Duvall, uh, Wendy's uh, character, starts wearing more neutral colors. Now, um, you know, you could chalk it up to being the seventies, you know, uh, where everybody was wearing like uh, tans and stuff, but, but uh, that's because she's neutral to the hotel. Um, uh, Danny is, is antagonistic to the hotel. And then Jack, you'll notice actually is wearing like whatever um, dominant, you know, it's like a warm room. He's wearing warm colors. He's wearing that red jacket a lot. 
Um, so there's there's a lot of um, he's he's become part of the house, uh, as you can see, and and um, didn't start off that way because remember he's wearing a blue suit jacket in the interview scene, um, which is you know to show that he hasn't quite gotten you know uh, taken over. Um, and uh, cool colors are usually blue, purple, and uh, uh, green. So, you know, just, just kind of basic stuff there. Um, they don't use a lot of complementary colors, like I mentioned before. However, whenever they enter into room 237, this is the thing that kind of blew my mind. That it kind of uh, puts you, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, the way the colors uh, all of a sudden go to secondary colors. Because no longer are you looking at, you know, the, the blues and the reds and the yellows. You're now looking at green and purple as the, the dominant uh, colors. It almost makes it like a dreams realm that you step into this. Um, and the, the secondary colors are just kind of off-putting too, um, which kind of helps the scene. But but also, just like I said, they're, they're uh, very rarely used. And at the end of the film, uh, Shelley Duvall takes off her brown jacket to reveal a green plaid shirt, which now she's, she's, she's actually wearing a complimentary color to Jack's red uh, coat. So, so you know, the, again, it's like the colors are fighting the entire movie. Um, yeah. Uh, because like, she had like a jacket on uh, through part of it. And then all of a sudden um, she takes it off and, you know, it's like, boom, you know, you can see that, that she's in conflict with him uh, by, by her plaids. Mm -hmm. um, one, one more thing before we, cause we should get to the actual hotel, but uh but during, at the end of the interview, so after uh, uh, Danny has had this first uh, episode uh, in, in Boulder, uh, as Jack is waiting to get you know, the final confirmation from Ullman, um, he's sitting in the lobby and he's reading uh, a magazine. This is a, a smaller note. Um, and I don't know if Forrest has a chance to pull it up on screen, but... Um, He's he's reading a Playgirl magazine, not a Playboy, but a Playgirl. I think it's um, I forget how it was labeled in that. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so this is <laughs> on the right is the is a shot from the movie, and then someone found because you can see what the cover is. Someone found what the issue of the Playgirl is, um, and there's an article on the front page that says incest: Why parents sleep with their children, and this is something that. In the production, Stanley Kubrick or someone else in the in the crew hands to Jack Nicholson and says, "Here, read this." Um, and then this is what ends up in the film that he's reading during a job interview. Uh, like, so there's a surreal aspect to all of this, but it's and and it's a minor. Obviously, it's a minor thing that you wouldn't catch normally. Um, but it's it's something that I think affects both the the performance and kind of the, the psychology of, of Jack in the movie. Um, but it's just one more of those things that kind of gives us a greater insight into some of the stuff that I think is happening kind of below the surface in this movie. Um, that again, I, I, like I said, this is probably one of the most overanalyzed movies of all time. And I think uh, there's a reason for why it's so overanalyzed and I'll share my th thought on that in a moment, but um people have picked out every little detail. And so I think some of them genuinely are in fact important. Handing a prop to put into the actor's hand uh, to read in the middle of a scene is an important prop. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll buy that. I mean, like something, you know, that documentary, you know, room three, you know, two, three, seven, uh, it's, it's been, a, you know, it's been a while, you know, since, since I watched it and, and I, I was, you know, more than a little high when I watched it, so I might have missed, you know, I might have missed important <laughs> documents. Uh, but, uh, but I remember a lot of well, you know, Kubrick was such a careful filmmaker. He went through you know hundreds of you know versions of you know the shot, and then like, therefore, this incredibly tiny detail must mean this like you know huge leap from that. It's like yeah. you know some of these might just be like, yeah, okay, he did a hundred versions and there was something in this one that he liked the most, right? That doesn't necessarily, like it doesn't actually mean that every detail of the composition is significant in the way that people suggested, but this example does seem pretty legitimate. There's, I think, I, I, again, I'll, I'll explain what I, where I'm going with this a little bit later once we get more into the story, but I think there's a, uh, a lot of people who end up watching this movie that can sense that there's something more to it than what's on the surface and they end up reading all of these numbers they end up counting things so there's theories of like 
uh, the number 42 keeps coming up. What, what's up with 42? Um, you know, there's uh, 12 canisters of whatever in the kitchen. Like they just start like it's it's a it's a funny movie because there's a lot that uh, should be overlooked. And there's some things that are, in fact, overlooked that shouldn't be. Um, yeah. And of course, this all takes place in the Overlook Hotel. Um, yeah, mm. fun. Ooh. Um, anyways, we can we can move on from this. Uh, right, just just a, a uh, very strange prop. So, uh, so Andy, thank you so much for coming on, brother. Really, uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Happy birthday, Ben. It really does mean a lot that I could join you for this. All right. Uh, Good to see you, Andy. Uh, Right. Thanks, Andy. Uh, care, uh, uh, I know I say this all the time, but you know the reason that the the thumbnails uh, for the uh, the episodes and streams are always so awesome uh, is Andy. If you uh, if you have uh, graphic design stuff and uh, and you're looking to uh, and you're looking to to hire somebody for that, uh, this is your guy. So um, so yeah, thank you so much. And he works on a second's notice. <laughs> <laughs> Lean production. Just keep it going. <laughs> yep. All right. Thanks so All much, right. man. Thank you. All right. Uh, we are now joined uh, by Anna Kasparian from uh, the Young Turks and Jacobin. Anna. Hey, guys. Hey, Yo, thank Anna. you for having me. I kind of like invited myself uh, through Kale, but I'm really happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm really happy you could make it. Uh, I think you know everybody else here. Uh, Ryan, Anna, Anna, Ryan. Hi, Anna. Nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you, Ryan. Um, uh, I'm really getting a kick out of this conversation because um, I had not seen The Shining until about two days ago. And oh, yeah. um, I wanted to feel a little informed on on because you know you watch the movie and and i think kale is absolutely right like you watch it and you get this sense that there's obviously a lot more to it than what you experience the first time around which is why i totally get why people overanalyze it watch it multiple times um and it leaves you with so many different questions right like of course the big question is what does the final scene mean um but what I thought was interesting about this is it, it reminds me a lot of other forms of art, right? Mm -hmm. Where the artist kind of wants to leave you to interpret it any way that you want to interpret it. And I think that there are so many different themes that, you know, there's evidence to those themes, um, including like the cycle of violence, um, the denial of um, the violence that people are part of have engaged in you know in this case uh the denial of uh violence toward uh genocide native americans all of that um and then yeah i think that there are weird like sexual elements to it as well um you know kale brought up the the playgirl magazine um and i hadn't even caught that until i went out of my way to watch uh room 20, uh, 237 last night, just so I wouldn't sound like a noob on the stream today. Um, it's just, it's, it's just such a fascinating movie and there really is a lot more to it than, um, you know, what you see on the surface. Fair enough. Uh, can I just say though, just, you know, so we're all, you know, cars on the table. I watched this movie like super late last night after a <laughs> week. So, like, I feel like we have I the full it. spectrum of like people who've seen this a bunch care a lot about it. Someone who saw it recently, but also did a little background research, and me who's just no, I'm I'm with you. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm with you, David. People are coming here with their color theory <laughs> analysis ready. I I literally watched it this morning, so that that's that where I'm at. Popcorn, <laughs> you know, is nice. I, I mean, I've time. seen it, I've seen it many times in my life, but I literally rewatched it this morning. For, that was my preparation for Hell this. Yeah. So. <laughs> I I saw it I saw it as a as like a I guess a preteen, just because I like I wasn't like a big horror movie fan at the time, but like my parents let me watch it when I was like really young because of the story I told you about the the house in Maine where they had written red rum on the on the walls to try to scare them out of it. And my parents have told me that story so many times and they're finally like, look, this is what they did. And so I, I had it on VHS when I was a kid, but um I don't know. I, I was I didn't watch it for a while and then I just did twice uh for the stream. Nice. 
I also watched yeah. the Simpsons parody today, so I'm, I'm very prepared. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, no, I, I actually have it. a question for you guys, real quick, because um, what I'm trying to understand is when Jack, you know, walks into like that gold room, right? Mm. And then there's the bar and everything. Is it like his own psychosis? Is he just um, imagining things in that room, like that roaring 20s type atmosphere? Um, the exchange that he has with Lloyd over at the bar, like what does that mm -hmm. mean? And is it just something that he himself is seeing or is it like the past haunting him? Like, I, I'm curious about that. Like wh yeah, no. what are your guys' take on that? Yeah, I, think there's a lot of I think the movie is really trying to suggest yeah. that it's psychosis. That's at least that's how the movie feels to me. I think the book, I haven't read the book, but my understanding is the book is it's more clear that it's supernatural, but I mean, I think that, I think that there are parts of the plot of the movie that are really hard to understand. Otherwise, like Lloyd literally lets him out of the uh, the, the the like food room that he's uh, mm -hmm. he's locked in. Yeah, that's the big one. That's, that's yeah. the big one that I think there, I think all of it could have been. I think all of it can be psychosis until that. Like yeah, uh, yeah. No uh, but there's also but uh, but there's also the cook who uh, who Danny like. Uh, psychically alerts you know in, oh in, yeah uh, so i think the shining is supposed to be real like that there's a psychic connection between um the cook and, and danny but it's not so clear to i mean except yeah. I, that's a good point about uh lloyd letting him out of the that's harder to explain without it being uh, yeah I, I, I would also yeah. say that i mean i don't know how much of this to read into uh the kubrick movie but uh mm -hmm. like there are a lot of stephen king novels uh, I don't remember if it's specifically in this one or not, where there's some suggestion that what we think of as ghosts isn't quite literally ghosts, but there is something paranormal going on mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. that like sort of emotionally intense events leave a charge yeah. in like a house or a building. And so mm -hmm. like that, that is certainly also a way to read, you know, at least a lot of this. Mm -hmm. Well, but I, I just wanted to, you know, to say though, like with the idea that a psychosis or time travel or anything like that, like, it is very interesting how he is a employee of the hotel, but when he's going back into those twenties, he's interacting with all those people as if he's like a patron or a bigwig, right? There's so much of the way that he interacts with the space and then with the ghosts or whatever you want to call them. That is not an employee or a worker at the hotel, but is a guest um, or even in some levels, like a, you know, a VIP guest who has more and more insight than anyone else into the inner workings of the system. Or at the very least, some kind of manager, like in a in kind of a more of a managerial uh, position, mm -hmm. where it's like he's given he's kind of given the ability to schmooze throughout the <laughs> the hotel um, on his on his off periods. I yeah, I mean, I don't I don't know. I there's also kind of a reading that he is the hotel on some level, like like he is like kind of you know what I mean, like a part of the hotel almost, and that he's kind of been there forever because like all of them have kind of been there forever, like him and Grady and. I, I don't know. Well, so so that's where again I think there's it's an important distinction between uh, I think Kubrick's introducing and again that's the the Carl Jung book that he he throws in there immediately to kind of give you a hint that this is where his his mind is at that there's the archetypes and then there are the actual characters and mm -hmm. so Jack Torrance is in fact a writer with a family that is staying there that that winter um, that I think that's fair and it's important for certain kind of uh, thematic and in, uh, kind of again the, the story that's going on with the characters does matter at the same time of course um, how these people fit into those roles that they occupy when they're staying in the hotel is kind of another thing and and I think that's part of what you you get with the the photo at the end that there's certain things that continue to repeat throughout history um, but Going back to the, you know, is is it supernatural? Is it uh, ghosts? Or is it uh, cabin fever? Are people going crazy? Is Jack going crazy specifically? Um, we're jumping all over the place, obviously. But uh, what's important, what, like what Forrest said is that, and, and what Ben said is that for a lot of this, there is an ambiguity where you can explain it. There, you can explain the movie through ghosts and through supernatural uh occurrences and it makes sense as a movie it logically kind of all adds up um and you can do the same thing with it's all uh you know jack losing his mind though the one thing of course is what forrest mentioned which is that um there's one thing that seems physically impossible which is that it seems like there's a ghost that lets jack out of the the storeroom towards the end um but 
before I get to that, I mean, throughout the movie, every time that Jack is seeing a ghost or experiencing some kind of supernatural um, occurrence, he is, there is always a mirror in frame. There's always something reflective. When he's talking to Lloyd, mm -hmm. he's literally looking at a glass wall. Um, when, uh, you know, when he's talking to um, Grady, when he's in the storeroom, he's looking at a reflective metal surface. Um, you can see throughout the movie, there's certain, um, as Jack is walking through the entrance or to the entrance of the gold room, he's passing mirrors and he's reacting in front of mirrors. And so it becomes a means for him to uh, kind of uh, express his frustration that, that he has towards his family primarily. Um, and anyway, so, so again, you, you can understand, okay, maybe this is someone you know, we're stuck in someone's head as they're as they're losing it. Um, now, to the the question of the storeroom, um, I do think there's a plausible explanation that does not require ghosts or supernatural. Uh, I don't know if we want to jump to the end of the movie just yet, but uh, Ben, your call. Do you want you want the take, or do we move? Do we come back uh, okay. to it? I, I, well, I want to hear the take. Quick. Save my theory, please. So, so, so just real quick, I, I would I would say. There are also a couple other things in the movie that certainly at least aren't in Jack's head. Maybe they're in other people's heads. Mm -hmm. uh, so Wendy has seen the the ghosts or whatever. She's seen the 1920s people at the end of the movie. Jack's not even there. Uh, and she doesn't and see them until she's losing, until she's completely lost it. She's in a state of, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, Terrif not, she's terrified. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. like she's not. So when she is more, um, I mean, I, she's never really emotionally stable, but like when she's more um, like, when she's more together and when she's trying to kind of keep her family together, she doesn't see the ghosts and it's kind of, you know, yeah, both so Annie and Jack. Might be, she her. might be losing it, but at least does yeah. seem pretty suggestive that she's at least having the same hallucination that Jack mm -hmm. is. And then, uh, and then of course, Danny, uh, whatever Maybe happened. Maybe Danny is transmitting Jack's hallucination into Wendy's <laughs> mind. And, Could be. And, uh, and, and also <laughs> like whatever happens to Danny in room 237, seems to involve some kind of physical component. Yeah, uh, I just I see I took that to be Jack. Like Jack heard him and then Jack goes into the room and hallucinates. Okay, that's interesting. As as yeah. far as but but the other thing I want to say to Kale is that no, it it's not it's not my call. I'm I'm, I'm I am stepping back, you know, from my <laughs> uh, hosting duties here. Forrest is supposed to take a, take us through the movie. All I'm and you to I mean, contract. you have an obligation to your employers. <laughs> all, 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 do all you I'm, not care about my responsibilities? I signed a contract <laughs> with my employers. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm supposed to be doing is drinking and heckling while he takes us through the movie. Yeah, so, well, I mean, <laughs> whatever we can kind of, want to. Right. We that's my usual it. role. Yeah, we can we can keep it. Uh, I I'll, I I want to hear the theory, but then we can go back on track and, and kind of yeah. talk our way through it. Okay, and so it's it's relevant, obviously, to everything that else has happened prior to <laughs> to that point. But um, so again, okay, so either you can explain it through. Uh, Grady, uh, who lets Jack out, Grady's the um, a ghostly figure that Jack sees uh, in the bathroom um, at one point. Uh, or um, if it's not Grady, uh, some of the other possible options, you know, he maybe he could, uh, he has an ax by the time he meets Wendy, maybe he chopped his way down. But we know that that's not true because uh, Kubrick, for some strange reason, as Jack is chasing Danny later on, uh, you, there's a shot of Jack walking through the kitchen and you can see the door clearly open. It's not beat up. It's not uh, chopped down. Um, one of the other things is that throughout the movie, there's uh, innumerable spatial um, errors throughout the set that uh, there are a lot of the doors that you see down the halls are not leading to actual rooms because they physically could not be there. That you have hallways that are parallel with like the great, like the big hall in the, in the, in the hotel. And there's all these doors along there, but that wall should be two meters wide. There's no way there's a, a room in any of these, in these doors. And so similarly in the kitchen, there's another door that is attached to the storeroom, but it's behind uh, a number of boxes uh, and, and um, crates of, of, you know, store food. But um, again, you see Jack walk through the kitchen. So he didn't get out through a different door. He got out through the door that you that we see that we assume that Grady opened. If it's not Grady, then it's someone else, and it's probably not Wendy because she just locked him in there and walked away. The other plausible explanation, which I actually do think is really plausible, is that it's Danny. 
that Danny lets Jack out of the, the storeroom. Because at that point in the movie, uh, Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. It's uh, it's Tony. Mm -hmm. And and Tony, it's again, you can, it's just an interpretation of a movie. It's not, you know, there's no way to verify this necessarily, but you can understand cohe uh, coherently that Tony actually lets Jack out of the storeroom and then warns, Dan uh, warns Wendy and then ultimately uh, actively traps his father in the maze at the end of the movie. That instead of a, a you know a, a chase um, that he is completely victim to, that like the Roadrunner cartoons that he's watching throughout the movie, he is able to outsmart the big bad wolf that comes knocking down the door, and uh, well in that case it's a coyote. But he he effectively you can explain the ending as him trapping his own father. Uh, but again, we can come back to to kind of more of the the meaning of of the ending. But it's well, it's a plausible explanation. Kill. Well, can I, I add to that? Because oh yeah, please, please. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Ben. No, I just wanted to add to the fact that like one thing that I found really interesting about the movie was, you know, in the beginning, um, as as Danny and his mother are kind of like touring the outside of the hotel, um, you know, they're looking at that maze and they're told that the maze is, you know, you're, you're not going to be able to get out of there. It's really difficult, you know, something along those lines. Um, and then there was a scene later in the movie where Danny and his mother were just like, they got to the middle of the maze and I'm like, how the hell are they going to get out of there? Right. That looks super complicated. And it wasn't a problem. I don't know if that means anything, but I found that strange. Yeah. And you can understand it as Danny. Again, this is an interpretation. You can understand at some level because Danny's a child, but he has Tony, which is this it's, I'm going to give you my take. I think Tony is uh, Danny's unconscious, but it's like, an mm. extremely all-knowing unconscious. It's that's I think the supernatural element that it's 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 an unconscious that knows all of our unconsciouses know too much in a, at a certain sense that we find ourselves surprised when we know something that we didn't realize that we know. But it's a, it's an uh, unconscious that knows a lot and is able to communicate that to the person that it's in. Um, and so you can understand it as Danny with Tony studying the map that. Uh, you know, at the same time, Jack is maps also of, studying the map maps overhead. Of meaning. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. uh, Kale, uh, the first thing you said before Anna responded, uh, I, I have a serious objection to, which is that um, that was a incredibly half-hearted imitation of Danny's, you know, of Tony saying, Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. I think you could do better. That's why dance. Forrest is here. <laughs> dance for Ben, dance. It's his birthday. It's, yeah, it's his birthday. <laughs> Come on, Kel. You're not. You're not going to give me a better version of, of Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. Danny's not here, Mrs. Torrance. Oh, there you go. Oh, so good. creepy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Rob. <laughs> oh, super creepy. Like that part was like, oh, stop saying that. Yeah. <laughs> I do like. Uh, I do like this this way of thinking about about Tony that Kale's introducing because mm -hmm. Tony is way too sinister of like a thing. To not be involved in some of the, you know, the evil that's going on, right? Because if you yeah. don't include that, then he is somebody who understands that there's evil happening, mm -hmm. um, but it's extremely scary the entire time. Yeah, and it makes you think, like, you know, uh, uh, for example, like a child of abuse. Sometimes there's like a little bit of of joy in increasing the antagonism, right, and being able to have some control over the conflict in the family, mm -hmm. right, and opening up the door um, for dad to go crazy. Um, you know, is is like a possibility there, and then you know the victory in the end of Danny over Tony, um, you know, defeating the father and in, in the support of the mother. I don't know. I like. I'm just saying. Like, I like that. I like that theory. You've got to. You've yeah. got to bring. You've got to bring down the 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 father, and and then you know the archetypes. It's it's really important <laughs> that to find meaning. You know, <laughs> um, <laughs> I I I think that something that adds to Kale's theory is that there is the um there really like there is a diagram of the maze in the middle of the the hotel which we see when they're in the maze jack is standing over the um mm. like the model the model, the model yeah. maze yeah so there so there is you know there is a pathway through so um i think that you know if you are going to go with the theory that uh tony is danny's unconscious then the unconscious might have been working its way through that maze like like physically even if Danny isn't necessarily physically processing, like, all right, here's how you get through the maze. 
Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, that seems right. Uh, should say, by the way, thank you, Shakti, for the super chat. Uh, says, uh, I gotten a couple others. I haven't always wanted to interrupt people to uh, to acknowledge them, but I've, I've, I think I've at least shown all of them. Uh, so uh, Saktu says the novel analogizes alcohol with the supernatural, so alcoholic spirits can haunt Jack hmm. and change his behavior, just like the Overlook Hotel can. Uh, the distinction is deliberately unclear, I think. I mean, wh whatever else is true about how you're supposed to read what's literally going on in the movie, hmm. I mean, at the very least, certainly on a symbolic level, I mean, definitely all the stuff with the hotel just, you know, is Jack's psychodrama and his, you know, his, his alcoholism and abusiveness, you know, like, yeah. like you know, being manifested this way. Mm -hmm. well, and and I, it's kind I of the same. You... Yeah. Oh, okay. No, no, go, go ahead. Go, go, go. Um, it's kind of the same thing with like the, the quick implication that um, it's like on an ancient uh, Indian burial ground. And, and they had to fight off Native Americans to build the hotel itself. Like it's this imprint of trauma that, you know what I mean? That like stays on places. And obviously like the murder, like it's different levels of like physical trauma, but I mean, on a, on a subconscious and like, you know, I mean, alcohol abuse level and physical abuse level. Like if you're going as in like the hotel is Jack's mind, like those levels of trauma stay around. So like that supernatural traumatic element, you know, is also, um, I guess, mirrored in, in what would be in his actual like mental state. So, okay. More, more hot takes, I guess. Cause I, I think you can and should watch the movie in two different ways. Cause you can watch it as the supernatural horror film where it's, you know, uh, basically a haunted house story with ghosts that possess people and turn them into evil, horrible things. Um, you know, turns Jack into a horrible monster that wants to kill his family. And I think you can also watch it as uh, a movie that basically is not a supernatural movie that has no ghosts. It's um, it's a movie about uh, it's a father that is uh, assaulting his son, and and if you understand the movie from Danny's perspective, if you if you say he's the protagonist and not Jack, then you can understand why things are happening when they're happening. Um, and why Danny, you know, that he's he's an active agent throughout the movie that's actively changing what's going on. Um, and we haven't gotten to this, but like kind of halfway through the middle of the movie, uh, there's the scene where, you know, Jack is already, you know, uh, he's been, you, it's implied that he's already somewhat losing it. He's, um, you know, that there's cabin fever. They've been there for at least a month. Um, although the time is intentionally not super clear, they're giving you dates or they're giving you days of the, of the week, but it's the, it, the actual time is starting to mush a little bit. Um, but Danny at one point, uh, after they're watching Danny and, um, uh, and Wendy are watching summer of 42 in the, in the, uh, I guess the big hall and, um, summer 42, interestingly enough, the scene that they're watching, it's about um, a younger guy who has a relationship with an older woman. Ja uh, Danny goes up to get his, his fire engine from Jack. And there's this really unnerving scene where mm -hmm. uh, Jack puts Danny on his lap and, uh, and oh, Danny's yeah, that's completely the, that's paralyzed. That's the fucking most unnerving scene in the whole movie, yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, Definitely. so this is, because, so my, my understanding of why this movie is so overanalyzed is because there is something going on underneath the surface that is never shown in the movie, which is that Jack sexually assaults Danny. And it happens at the end of the scene that we don't see because it cuts to the next scene. But it's implied through like leading up to it that he's been assaulting him physically. Uh, this happens, and then we get uh, shortly thereafter we get these weird dreamlike, and I think actually the room two three seven scenes are dreams um, with the with the hag. Well, it turns you know it begins as a woman turns into a, an old decaying woman um, that uh, and it's. First, you get Danny walking into to the room, which is supposed to be kind of a, a rationalized version of the, of the Torrance apartment. Uh, you get Danny walking in, um, which of course there's this <laughs> the whole, I haven't even touched on any of like the moon landing conspiracy stuff because there's the stuff with him with the, the rocket on his shirt uh, that says Apollo 11, which some take to be a conspiracy that Kubrick is admitting to faking the moon landing but I think is actually probably just more obviously a phallic symbol on his, on his uh, sweater. 
going into the room, uh, later we see Jack entering the room. I think you can understand that scene as not actually Jack, but it's a dream that Danny's having. There's intercuts with, with Danny in bed, frothing at the mouth. There's, there's spit coming mm. out of his mouth. There's a scene where just around, you know, around that time that uh, Jack has the nightmare where he has spit coming out of his mouth. There's a very obvious connection there of something coming out of their mouths of Danny having the little boy that lives in his mouth and uh, mm. Jack, ostensibly what's Jack is entering into room 237. I think it's, it makes more sense. And this isn't my theory. There's other people who've made this argument. Um, so, you know, uh, there's a YouTuber named Rob Ager that's made this argument. I think it's convincing that this is uh, basically a dream that Danny's having where he's taking on the role of his father. And you can understand it one of two ways. Um, you can understand it as him punishing his father in the dream, or you can understand it as, uh, associating himself with his father. And again, this is this idea of a cycle of violence that continues on um, and in both the, in kind of in the family unit and then also in this wider sociological, you know, in the society sense that we see with the fact that it's built on an Indian burial ground. The, the, the whole theme of genocide of Native Americans is completely on the surface. That's, that's canon. That's, there's no way that's not like a, like that is a part of the movie. So, um, and people, you know, it's like, oh, it's an interpretation. They they mention it throughout the entire thing. Like that is obviously part mm -hmm. of what they're talking about. But what's not shown, again, is uh, is Danny being sexually assaulted. Um, and, you know, if you want another example of a movie where this exact same device happens, where you have uh, an older individual, an older man having a sexual relationship with uh, a minor, uh, Look at Lolita, which, oh, was directed by Stanley Kubrick. <laughs> like, they don't show any sexual actions in that movie, in part because of the, um, because of the uh, movie codes that they weren't allowed to. Um, but they don't need to. It's all implied. And the same thing I think you can, you can understand through this movie as a child rationalizing and understanding their abuse. Um, and, and again, this, you know, so anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll come back with more in a moment, but so don't mean yeah. to get I, real dour. <laughs> no, I'm glad that you brought that up because I, I was about to mention that um, because you're right about, it, it's very obvious that, uh, you know, violence against Native Americans is kind of like, I don't know if I want to say front and center, but it's on the surface. You notice that. Um, but I feel like the overall message in the film is about cycles of violence, right? And I think that the sexual violence component of it isn't as obvious. Um, and all of the like most uncomfortable moments have to do with, with the sexual violence. Like every time Danny brought up, you know, his is it Tony, his imaginary friend? Yeah, um, yeah. I, yeah, Tony in his mouth. I was like, okay, I, obviously that's that means something. The foaming at the mouth thing, you're right, Kale, that stood out to me as well. And then, it, you know, there's like the cycle of domestic violence. Like Wendy was so clearly terrified um, by Jack even before uh, Jack really started to lose it, right? And and you could tell in the way that he would, she would talk about jack dislocating danny's shoulder and like how mm -hmm. she would make excuses for it and it was it was an accident it was an accident but in the way that she would um you know uh disclose that incident uh you could tell that she knew that it's not normal that it's not just an accident you can tell that she's afraid of jack like i think the audience gets the sense that jack is kind of not all there like from the beginning even before they're in that hotel i don't know if you guys got that sense but oh yeah, yeah jack yeah, really definitely. yeah De I mean, totally creeped me like, out from the beginning like, like i don't i don't have uh you know a phd in, in the shining studies like kale does you know like like I <laughs> a few times but uh but, <laughs> but like i always thought that the I mean, only grad uh, school i would go to by the way <laughs> 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 uh, that scene when they're first driving up the mountain um, and uh, they start talking about the daughter party. Oh, God. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and like, with his like tiny son there, you know, Jack starts talking about cannibalism. Uh, and, you know, and yeah. uh, Danny says, Oh, I, I know all about it. I saw it on the TV. And he just turns to and he's like, See? 
it's okay. He saw it on the TV. It's like, yeah, he's already like 90%. Yeah. Away there. Well, I also yeah. got the, the full contempt that he has for, like Ryan was saying earlier, like yeah. the contempt he has for his family, which yeah. you don't, I don't think, I mean, he's very smarmy in the first scene, which actually is a perfect way to get us back to the going through the movie. Like he's extremely smarmy in the first scene, but when he, when he interacts with his family, like number one, like dropping the facade on the phone with, with Wendy completely, like, you know what I mean? Like, she's like, oh, did you get the job? And he's like, he's like, listen, like, fuck you. Like, I don't know if I got the job. I want to get off the phone. Like, you know what I mean? Like his tone, yeah. like the tone changes yeah. completely. And then later in the car, as they're going up to the hotel, when he's like, see, he saw it on the television. Like yeah. it, it does come off as unhinged, but it also comes off as just, he fucking hates his family. Yeah. Like there, there is yeah. like, there's like hatred yeah. oozing from his voice throughout that whole scene. Yeah, he didn't need any ghosts to be motivated to murder his family. It was already there on the car right now. Like, <laughs> oh, is, it, is that a is that a ghost? Oh well, yeah. I guess yeah. gotta take, yeah. take the axe. <laughs> Jack, I mean, throughout the movie, Jack is is severely frustrated. And both in kind of a general like there's the obvious, like he's creatively frustrated. He's like, you know, we, we get to the typewriter in a moment. Um but I think you could also say that he's sexually frustrated, that he doesn't see Wendy as his wife. He sees Wendy as his mom. He, and if, if he is, in, I think he is, I think he's sexually assaulting his son. Um, and there's all these verbal cues. Again, when he's, in the, when he's in the gold room speaking to Lloyd, which again, either he's speaking to a ghost or he's literally looking at a mirror and rationalizing to himself. Um, and he's talking about, you know, uh, this little fucker that like ruined my papers, like the way that he talks about his son in both angry and sexual language and, uh, and the way that he rationalizes it into, you know, uh, it's, I, I, it was just a couple, uh, foot pounds per second too much, like that it's this, it, it's just this, he's uh, trying to, to the best of his ability distance himself from what he does because he also probably hates himself um and again that's what wendy does as well that she doesn't see i mean the thing is that she sees all of this and yet she doesn't allow herself consciously to see this until the very end of the movie um when you get uh again this is this this motif of bears <laughs> Uh, where you finally see when wendy finally sees in the most obvious form uh, a man in a bear costume, ostensibly giving head to uh, someone in a you know someone in a, a suit or whatever. That um, it it makes yeah. really no sense out of this context. That it, it really is just kind of a totally weird, out of place moment. That you can go, oh, it's for shock value, but it's I, it's not really because again, I think that's one of these things that people see that and they go, yeah, I. I understand at some level that there's something going on here and it's really fucked up, but I don't know exactly how to say it. Uh, yeah. And again, this is, this is this whole theme of those things that are overlooked and, and Kubrick saying, you can't overlook these things anymore. You, well, have, we to, had, you um, have to face them. We had, it kind of goes to a conversation that we were having a couple weeks ago. We had Nando on the podcast and he was, he was talking about um, like the, the frustration of like the precarity, a lot of like PMC journalists and, and other like professions like that, like ostensibly creative professions like have right now with kind of the precarity of their position and, and, and all this stuff. And I feel like Jack is a very early version of that. Like he's a teacher that's not, you know, because of his own mental state. Sure. But like, is not allowed to teach. He like, he's a writer that can't write like, he, he's, you know, he, he feels like he's an academic of some kind that isn't being fulfilled by any of that. He's kind of just working odd jobs. And I feel like that frustration and that like hating of your life, like has become a theme for like a lot of people in that kind of class of people so much more in the last few decades since The Shining. Yeah. I mean, right. In, in his case, the, uh, the, um, his uh, alcoholic and abusive and unstable behavior caused the economic precarity. I think it'll, yeah. you know, I think in the cases that Nando's talking about the, uh, the economic precarity drives people crazy. Yeah. But I mean, it's still, it's still happening at, at the moment where these like massive layoffs are starting. You know what I mean? Like, like sure. Like they, he probably did something and got pushed out of his position for like a good reason. But at the same time, like it, it is kind of that, like that economic precarity makes everything worse. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely mm -hmm. a there for sure. Yeah. Um, so do you want to? Do you guys want to go start 
going back through uh, everything now that we've. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, maybe not in quite as small units as we were before. Yeah. But yeah. All right, so they uh, they get to the hotel. Um, you know, time travel back <laughs> to the beginning of the movie. Um, so, so the family gets up to the hotel, and um, that's when they meet Dick Halloran, who's played by Scatman Crothers, um, who's like the person that realizes that Danny isn't just kind of a, a kid with an imaginary friend, who, I mean, ostensibly realizes that he has this telepathic uh, power of the shining, which I, I think if you're looking at Kale's reading of it, it's kind of interesting because it's like people who have been abused can tell other people have been abused. So there, there is kind of, I mean, in some sense, that uh, that reading of it, I think, like, because he's talking about like his own family situation and how his family was the one that realized that they all had the shining and like that trauma that goes with that. But you know, so he's showing them around the hotel and um, and and so uh, Jack goes with the with the managers to like finish the paperwork and stuff, and um, and Wendy is is left. With, well, Wendy and Danny are left with uh with Dick Haller and he's walking around the kitchen and showing them like kind of all of the food you could possibly ever want to eat. And like the, the storeroom that you'll see, like that we see later on in the movie in the kitchen. And it's kind of foreshadowing, foreshadowing all of that. And then they kind of walk through the, the gold ballroom ballroom. And uh, I think I got that out of order a little bit, but Danny goes off with uh, Dick Halloran who explains to him that he has the shining and that, you know, he, he shines and he can see the hotel because the hotel also shines and, you know, that the people who don't shine probably deny that to themselves. And it's almost like this childhood innocence, almost, you know, like people deny that to themselves. And like there's like this mystical element, I guess, of being um, being a child that people kind of give up and, and deny to themselves. So I, I don't know. Now, now Kale's got me on like the psychoanalytic reading of it. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone want to talk about anything there? Well, also, when they're going through the kitchen, uh, Wendy verbally says, like, wow, it's like a maze. And so they set up this idea that the hotel is in fact a maze. And yet there's this external maze that is outside the hotel that is not present in the aerial shots, but, you know, it's there, you know, the, the Wendy is going through it. Um, but this, this idea of like going around trapped, confused in circles in mazes, um, this ultimately, I think, becomes important for uh, for Danny, that um, Danny is seen going around in circles over and over and over again. This is this this cycle of repetition that is um, a part of uh, people that experience trauma, basically. Um, and you're following, it's, you're it's, following it's, him around through his own eyes during those scenes. I mean, like, you know, from or at least from his perspective, like those tracking shots, which I really, really like. But those tracking shots, you're traveling with him through the yeah. through the maze of the, of the hotel. Yeah, and I would I would just add that one thing that's so that they do so well in this movie, The Shining. Like I'm somebody who's extremely claustrophobic, right? Like I go like very quickly from like normal person to panic brain if I feel like I'm being like stuck in a room or the door's locked or anything like that, right? Is that why you're always in the in the big expansive mountains? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but, but, but why The Shining is so great is because it makes space something that's very scary, right? Like this, one of the scariest parts of the movie throughout um, is not ever really being confined, but the idea that there's this huge hotel and you just don't know what is behind, you know, every door, right? There, there's just, there's so much space that it becomes quite freaky to be three people in, you know, a hotel that should be able to accommodate hundreds and hundreds of folks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Oh, Anna, go ahead. I'd yeah, I just wanted to add, you know, um, that scene where um, Wendy's in the in the kitchen and it's it's large. And it, the, <laughs> I like that you brought up mazes, um, uh, Kale, because throughout the whole movie, you certainly get the feel uh, that Wendy is not only um, someone who feels trapped, but also incredibly lonely and isolated, um, mm. which is why. You know, one of the scenes that stood out to me was when, um, you know, she was checking the phones and they weren't working. And so she used some device that I don't recognize in order to, like, reach out to, um, I think, the park service or something. Yeah, and, it's a CB uh, radio, I think, right? It's the... Yeah, something. Yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But she's she's talking to someone um, and you can tell that the the man on the other end is is trying to, like, kind of wrap up the conversation 
Um, but she's really enjoying just like talking to another human being. And you can tell she doesn't want to get off the phone um, and even says, you know, it was a real pleasure talking to you. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that stood out to me because it, it, it just helped to, for me at least to, to really feel and understand just how lonely and trapped she feels. Mm. And, and I You're think right. that, I think that that's an important part of, um, her characterization throughout it, because I mean, I, I hate to keep going back to this kind of time period, but like, you know, it's at a time where like, like as, as like a wife, that's like a non-working wife, um, you're kind of trapped with your husband who's kind of fulfilling that economic caretaker position. But Jack is very much not like Jack is not fulfilling that role whatsoever. So she's kind of left knowing that she doesn't have um, maybe like maybe her life would maybe get a lot worse if she was stuck like with Danny by herself at mm. that, like during this time period. And uh, but also knowing that they, it's an untenable situation living with Jack. She's kind of stuck between those two things in complete isolation, but also like there's no way out of it. So she has to constantly kind of, uh, you know, defend Jack because of that, because, you know, it's like falling into the abyss, the unknown at that point, I think. Right. You also never really see yeah. them, uh, Jack and Wendy, interact as a married couple like that. Yeah. For the most part, mm -hmm. like Wendy treats Jack and Jack treats Wendy like it's a parent mother relationship that Wendy is like catering to Jack that Wendy's doing the chores Jack is sleeping all day he's you know he gets to play around with tennis balls and uh you know he writes when he wants to write uh it's like Jack does not wear a wedding ring Wendy does like there's all these oh. these things of just hmm. they they are not a married couple in any real substantive sense like that they they are trapped together in in the hotel but uh, it's a different, it's a, again, it's a very different kind of relationship. He even calls her the sperm bank or whatever. He's like the old sperm yeah, bank. Right. Like, yeah. like yeah. as in she's only a receptacle for bearing his children and nothing yeah. else to him. Yeah. Um, which is one of the most fucking disgusting like things that he says in the entire movie. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, so so there. Um, so Danny asks about uh, room two three seven to uh, to to Dick Haller, and and he's like, "Are you scared of room two three seven? Which you know, intrinsically speaking, he shouldn't know about. You know, without the the supernatural, I guess, shining power of um, of Tony, because you know nobody's mentioned two three seven as uh, anything, and you know the implication I think is that that's the room that the murder happened in, um, but then it's not because then you see the girls kind of lying dead in the hallway so i uh you know i don't i don't i mean I, we can all speculate i guess about the significance of that room as a particular um place for the trauma or the energy or the supernatural uh to come out of well i mean obviously that's where um the faking of the moon landing happened uh that's what Stanley <laughs> Kubrick was trying to express to us I, i'm sorry if i like <laughs> stepped on your toes kale but i i <laughs> No, I'm no. super curious about that theory and I like looked into it and I, I don't know if I'm buying that theory at all. Um, but I think it's interesting. Fun, fun fact, <laughs> yeah, by I, the way, when I was, um, uh, I was 19, uh, I was, uh, going to, uh, the university of Pittsburgh and my, uh, my grandmother then, uh, lived in, uh, in Youngstown. And I remember we, uh, stopped in at, uh, you know, my, uh, I think my mom had gone to pick me up for like a break or something, right. You know, from, from college. And we stopped in to see grandma in Youngstown. And, you know, it was like, this, she was very like, you know, grandmotherly. And she's asking me all these questions and, you know, what classes are you taking? And I mentioned, oh, I'm taking astronomy. And she was like, oh yeah. So I had a question. So the moon landed. Do you, do you think that would happen? Or, 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 or like, I, I, I don't know, Grandma. I'm pretty sure it happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, that's wow. what a normie. <laughs> Such a normie, Ben. You don't even know the real truth. Um, all right, do you want me to black your audience? Using that, you think those amazing special effects that existed at the time of the moon landed, they, they just they just seamlessly faked it. If, oh, if anyone mean, can do it, it's Kubrick. I mean, come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, don't think as, as have, a, um, I don't think Kubrick would have left the fan going. 
<laughs> he did that on purpose. It's a little clue for his attentive audience to notice. <laughs> well, as a as a actually would vulgar... be the word. Kubrick <laughs> was like leaving cues in the yeah. moon landing thing. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little play girl, like <laughs> National Enquirer. National Enquirer, like we yeah. think the moon landing. He's yeah, you can, yeah, you can oh, see it in the play girl that Neil Armstrong is holding when he steps on the moon. <laughs> You see, he this saw it on the, the poo on the on the moon. Yeah. <laughs> he saw it on the television, just like the moon landing, which didn't yeah. happen. <laughs> um, um, do, you want, do you want me to blackpill your audience on this real quick? <laughs> sure. Uh, there's, there's no like like the explanation of how the moon landing was faked doesn't uh, doesn't involve any molestation, right? Because I don't think I can take any more. No. <laughs> no, 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 I'm no. <laughs> Again, if anything, the this theory, oh God, this anything what, cover man? up. <laughs> well, no, but if anything, I mean, if anything, the theory that this is a, a an admission that Kubrick faked the moon landing is just another means of getting away from what I think is the more plausible, like psychological scar that this movie leaves on people but mm -hmm. the thing with the moon landing you know as a ben as a, as a vulgar logical positivist myself i don't know if we landed on the moon i didn't see it i didn't i wasn't there so <laughs> i don't know I, i'm just gonna state right now that it's possible that we did but i don't know uh so this is this is the theory that maybe we didn't which is that uh, Stanley Kubrick, as, as you're familiar, he produced the movie Dr. Strangelove uh, in the in 62, no, 63. Mm -hmm. And uh, what happened was he, you know, uh, there's a, a bomber plane that's prominent throughout the movie that half the movie basically takes place with the crew of the bomber that's headed towards the Soviet Union. Uh, and Kubrick uh, requested, again, I'm not, this is just what the theory is. So this is, take some of it as real and some of it not, you can choose. Um, and so the theory, so part of it is that Kubrick requested a bomber from the US government for as a prop basically, because we need to shoot inside of a bomber for the film. And they said, uh, no way, this is an anti-war movie. We're not giving you a bomber. And then he subsequently recreated the interior and exterior of the plane using photographs uh, that were available. And I believe he might have also had a, a veteran that was um, like a, a, a you know a, assistant or something. But either way, he creates a bomber for the movie, and the U.S. government goes, "Wait a minute! I thought we said we're not going to give him a bomber." And you know, the other imaginary U.S. official goes, "No, we didn't. That that was him. He just made that." And so they go, "Wow, this guy! If he could do that on a limited budget." why not give him a big budget and have him help us with this new project that we're starting up next year in 1964 uh, called NASA. And so they make him a deal that he can't refuse. We, the conspiracy does not really understand what the deal is, but there's a deal. Deals are made, folks. And a, deal. Uh, a perfect deal. <laughs> the best deal anyone has ever made. Uh. So he... Um, he makes a deal uh, with the with NASA and with the U.S. government with um, a deal with the devil uh, that you know perhaps might show up in a in a movie that we're discussing right now. But he makes this deal and he says, "Fine, I'm going to basically shoot the footage that we ended up all seeing uh, in 1969 of the moon landing and of astronauts walking on the moon." And the way that he helped prep this was by also producing at the same time what's largely considered uh, one of the magnum opuses of cinema of the 20th century, 2001 A Space Odyssey, where he used in two different scenes, I have a clip or I have a photo that Forrest can pull up of the front screen projection um, from 2001, um, that uh, in order to shoot the ape scenes, for instance, uh, all of that was on a soundstage in London. All everything on the moon was a soundstage in London. This is, uh, you know, if you're familiar with 2001: A Space Odyssey, it looks like they're in the middle of the desert. No, it's a soundstage. Kubrick faked it, and so if he can fake that, of course he can also fake the moon landing. <laughs> and uh, there's another photo for us. I think it's the immediate next one of a shot from 2001. So this is a, a shot from 2001 in 1968, which we had not yet been to the moon. We would get to the moon a year later. 
And this was Kubrick prepping the world for what we were supposed to expect of people on the moon, that um, people in the movie walk a little bit slower because of less gravity. And so that was Kubrick's way of showing that that's what it's gonna look like uh, next year when you see the moon landing. Um, anyways, all this happens between this and uh, the Shining, Kubrick makes a movie about mind control and convincing people, uh, basically like the, um, the Ludovico technique in Clockwork Orange, um, you get, uh, you know, th all these like films that are about either convincing people to do horrible things, same thing happens in Full Metal Jacket. Um, there's movies about uh, the elites uh, being like horrible and nefarious and you know debaucherous and you get that in um barry linden you get that later in eyes wide shut but ultimately kubrick uh he he's living with this tremendous guilt because according to the theory someone had to die and someone that knew about it and so that's where he confesses this in uh the shining and that's why halloran who is called in from Danny uh, ends up uh, losing his life over this. That Danny and Jack in The Shining, according to the theory, oh no, they froze. They froze Kale for a second. They don't <laughs> want us to know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I see Kale. Yeah, no, he, he's, he's back. <laughs> um, <laughs> the uh, Danny and Jack are supposed to be two sides of Stanley Kubrick. That. Jack is the business side. Danny is the, art, you know, the the more naive artistic side. Danny's the one that goes into room two three seven, which is the moon landing set, uh, and, and makes the you know makes the moon landing. But then ends up telling Halloran. He alerts Hall or, or, um, Dick Halloran, and and then the business side of Jack ends up having to kill this other. It's the only piece of evidence for this entire theory. <laughs> Basically, and I, I don't even want to call it a theory, but this this is uh, so. Wait, can you pull up the um the Danny Rocket one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. Uh. <laughs> after after this horrific scene with Jack and Danny in the bedroom with this horrible somber music, we get a moment later. Danny's on the famous carpet. He's playing with trucks on this strange. Uh, hexagon shape um uh if if you could for me for us if you can pull up the cape canaveral photo um <laughs> this is the <laughs> this is the launch Roasted. pad <laughs> for apollo 11. Oh, okay so this whole theory is like an amazing exercise in and especially if you have a whole bunch of people in it working at it how if you're looking for a pattern, you're gonna find it. Like if you're looking you're gonna for evidence, it. you're gonna find it. Um, and now I think I'm back pattern. to think, yeah, I mean, I think I'm back now to just thinking this is a ghost movie. Uh, forget everything <laughs> else. Like, <laughs> well, what I think we should be doing right now is doing our own conspiracy theory about how Kubrick knew about COVID-19 in advance. And this movie is a long metaphor for a quarantine. It is, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I will say yeah, was, he was telling us about this. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I had a little moment, you know, and it's funny because like at the, um, at the when Dick Halloran is coming from Florida and he, uh, he goes into, there's a, like the, uh, I think it's like where he's picking up the, you know, like snow cap or whatever he's using to, uh, to get up to the hotel. But it's like a, a fairly small space, you know, with like a few people in it and he's going into it. Uh, like I had this little moment of like, Ugh, you know, cause like, uh, cause, cause somehow that little, you know, social distancing, you know, part of my brain, you know, like went like lit up. It's like, Oh God, this is way too close. You can't do that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, when, he's on, course, when he's on the plane. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, it, I didn't even have it on the plane, but yeah, I had it there. Uh, mm -hmm. But, um, but there's something like weird about that. Cause of course, mm. like, Look, I've I've been watching more movies than than I had in years, you know, like in quarantine. Like I, I don't normally have this, uh, you know. Like I can distance. Like okay, this movie does not take place during the COVID nineteen pandemic. You can't be around people. Uh, and even earlier in this movie, like at the beginning, when Jack's doing his interview, all that stuff, right? You know, like like I never had that. 
So I was trying to figure out like why I had that little COVID, you know, uncomfortable reaction to the close quarters, you know, at that point in the movie. And I think it's because the family in their little bubble were acting like they were in quarantine for the last uh-huh. quarter. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but so, they're dreaming of like big parties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Very, very yeah, familiar. Yeah. They're dreaming about being able to go to parties. Yeah. <laughs> Wendy, can't you see I'm in a Zoom meeting? <laughs> 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 no, but you know, one other one other thing that people point to as evidence that this is about Kubrick coming clean about helping to fake the moon landing is, you know, when he loses it on Wendy at one point, he like really emphasizes having to do things that he doesn't want to do for his employers. Don't you understand? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and apparently, like that was an admission. That was Stanley uh, Kubrick's admission to the uh-huh. uh, to the viewer that um, he had no choice. It was a you know he had to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, I, I really think that it's with, just like, mm-hmm. yeah, it's something unique with NASA, really, that you have to do something that your employer told you to do and you have no choice but to do it, that you signed a contract. It's, it's, it's a pretty, uh, I, there's no other explanation other than that yeah. Stanley Kubrick the moon landing as evident by the sweater. I mean. Pretty sweet also, sweater, by the way. I, I, I'm into it. Yeah, I, mean, I would totally yeah, wear that sweater. I, I want that sweater. The, the, actual, the actual non-conspiracy story of uh, the Dr. Strangelove stuff that we kind of went into when we did Dr. Strangelove is so much more interesting, I think, than the moon landing story, which is that um, they, they had built, like, you know, NASA wouldn't let them get any kind of, uh, like, like any look at, at plans or designs. So they ended up having to look at, to, to make the bomber, they ended up having to look at plans, like at the library and stuff and like search through it. And the guy ended up making such a, um, like such a, such a realistic rendition of one of those bombers that like NASA contacted them and or like, how the fuck did you get this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> or like, you know, the Department of Defense, I guess, was the one that contacted them. And it was like, how the fuck did you get these plans to make this bomber? Like, mm-hmm. right. I mean, there there is like, there are, obviously, there's kernels of truth in all of this that like Kubrick did, in fact, work with NASA to create a special lens for Barry Lyndon, um, which is the movie that came <laughs> out right before The Shining. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> You know, I mean, Kubrick's last movie that he made, which he died three or four days after completing, is a movie about powerful elites that uh, are hedonistic and debaucherous and are basically above the law that can do whatever and get away with whatever. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, yeah that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, like, you know uh kubrick was someone who was very in tune with politics um i don't know if i i don't think i would call kubrick a marxist or a socialist or leftist or anything but he was someone who was very aware of politics and commenting on it often but to extrapolate from that to well actually uh the distance between the earth and the moon is 237,000 miles and the room is two is 237 and uh (laughs) It's the launch pad and the rocket going off and this is a movie set and like it's it's just not anything. I mean the funny joke is that one of the one of the things about room two three seven, because it has room N O um on the door key, and the main proponent of this theory says, Well, you know, obviously you can rearrange those letters and you can get moon room. This is the moon room. Um <laughs> Which people I, have I, rightly pointed out, you can also spell moron. So, <laughs> I, way, I, just, I wonder how many moon landing conspiracy theorists we are creating with this episode. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I, I, do also, I, I don't want to get too far off topic here, Kale, but at some point we're going to have you on and, and and do just like an earnest episode about why logical positivism doesn't entail that we don't know whether or not like you know we went to the moon. <laughs> I'm down. Let's do it. <laughs> I, I, while we're like, before we move on, um, like, I, I just wanted to say this. Um, I, so I had this idea. If Ben and I ever got really like powerful to the point where like we had like the most watched podcast ever and we could have whatever guests do whatever we wanted, like, like Chapo style, pretty much. My, my, an idea that I had earlier today is 
having 2001 uh, Space Odyssey, but we replaced the the Hal voice with uh, Adam Curtis. So we have like, <laughs> so he's just being talked to by, like, like we just redub it. So we just have like Adam Curtis fucking talking to him like about like disempowering his his revolutionary politics. <laughs> and and then a and then a funny thing happened when the oxygen stopped going to Dave Bowman's head. <laughs> But they miscalculated. <laughs> um, anyway, that's that's the that's the uh, the whole Cooper fake the moon landing. I mean, there's it's the thing is that like that's the only scene that you can make a plausible case, and it doesn't really add up. That like the numbers are wrong. Like it's not the moon and the Earth are not two hundred thirty seven thousand miles apart. Um, like, and even if they were. How does this lead to the conclusion that oh yeah Kubrick faked the moon landing like there's it's not it's even just style. so tenuous yeah. yeah like he's not somebody who's in your face with anything he's extremely subtle and then he decides oh this top secret thing this like world historic thing that I was involved in I'm going to be as in your face as possible about telling you the truth about this because right. he felt so bad about it <laughs> yeah and he felt so bad so like putting a couple of ambiguous hints in a movie he felt uh -huh. better than like that that yeah. was the, this this was this was what got it off his conscience yeah, I well, need plus, to tell them. A few people will know. <laughs> well, plus the non-parallel shadows and the flags waving and all. He gave us a lot of clues. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's the correct thing. <laughs> yeah. There, there, we're, there is we're, no we're moon in Big brains in on this podcast for everybody to know. <laughs> what's that, what's that doing? I said we're building big brains for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't believe in the moon anymore. So, so how do you guys want to do the rest of this? Do you want to go through it quickly and, and comment on it? Or uh, uh, I think yeah, if you yeah. get to like the the, the I'm mean, whatever y'all want to do, but I think if you get to the climax, like I think we can get to the really move in. Yeah, let's let's um, let's do maybe broad strokes and, and get to yeah. the, pretty quickly to the climax. All right. So, so we're at the point we're like half an hour into the movie where, yeah. <laughs> where, um, <laughs> where, um, where they're, they're alone in the hotel. And of course you have the scene like right after that, where they're walking around the, the maze, which becomes important later. And, and you have the scenes where Danny is kind of uh, tricycling, I guess, through the, through the hotel and you're seeing it from his perspective. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're, we're we're slowly going through uh jack going going insane i guess and um i don't know any any anyone have anything they want to talk about specifically with like scenes in, in the beginning of uh yeah yeah so I, I there's one thing that i want to understand like at least understand what your take is and this is for everyone um there was one thing that was inconsistent and i don't think that it was unintentional um so there's this scene where uh, Danny is in front, he's in the bathroom, he's in front of the mirror, he's talking to Tony. Um, the scene in and of itself is pretty creepy. Uh, and then there's like this inconsistency with like some sort of decal, like cartoon decal or sticker on one of the doors, which later mm -hmm. disappears. Kale, you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can you talk about that? Because I, I Kale think has a actually, whole theory about this, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure he does. And I like, you know, okay, so first let me just give you what my mindset is as I'm watching room 237. Like some of the theories are crazy. Like they're just crazy, yeah. they don't make sense, and people need to relax, right? But when they started talking about that, I, I was like pretty dismissive until I realized like, no, there, this had to have been intentional because why would you, why, like, why would you go out of your way uh, to take off a decal from a door? Like that's such a specific detail. Um, and so I just, I wanted to know what you think about that Kale or anyone who has a theory. I, I mean, again, I think there's, um, so you don't have to, it's not like a conspiracy. I mean, like it's something that's obviously in the movie. And so we can read the movie for what it is. So there is a scene where you're pushing in to see Danny in the bathroom and, and there's a, a dopey from the seven doors, uh, doors mm -hmm. on the door. Danny has his vision. And then the, the um, therapist is in the room is talking with him. And, and when you see the door the second time, when the, um, when Wendy and the therapist are leaving dopey, the, the dwarf is no longer on the door. 
I think just the most simple kind of explanation is that uh, Danny is no longer a dope. He has, he is now enlightened. He knows what's about to come. Um, that before he was, you know, he didn't know what, what the rest of the, you know, the story in front of him was. And then Danny, or, uh, um, Tony introduces him to the river of blood and to the, uh, the twins. Um, and basically saying like, it's a, it's a pretty bad premonition. So you can understand that in the supernatural version of like, there, Tony is supernatural and is foreshadowing the actual future. Or if you just want to take it at like the most like realistic, um, you know, I think it's conceivable that uh, Danny is aware at some level subconsciously that um, he's probably going to be going to the hotel with his parents. You know, it, it doesn't, he doesn't need to know that he got it or not. He just thinks, oh no, it's the, like, I was told by my parents that like, you know, he's, we might be staying in this hotel soon. Um, and Danny and Jack have a really horrific relationship. And so it's the fear of, of that moment coming um, and his subconscious warning him of a bad thing that is apparently around the corner. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's the, you know, so again, you could take it either way, but it's, it's uh, Danny now uh, no longer um, a dope. He's no longer uh, like the the fool or the he, he's aware of of what's about to happen. Yeah, super. Like it's just so crazy how like to David's point, just how subtle Kubrick's messaging is um, mm -hmm. in some regard. Because like I would have never noticed that. Like you have to pay such close attention to notice it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a that's a good explanation uh, for, for what also... that symbolizes. Right, because it doesn't it doesn't change the plot structure at all. It's it's you're mm -hmm. seeing what's happening in the scene, and it's consistent with the the narrative that's been told so far and that is being told. Um, so that's where I think like I think that's a a, a totally fine and acceptable uh, like continuity error catch that people have. Whereas like again, when people are looking around the kitchen and counting like bowls on the table and like there's 42 that they're like, I, I don't, I don't buy the whole 42 thing. Um, I think the yeah, 42 number is related to the summer of 42 movie. If there's anything there, because the summer of 42 movie does play like they, you start on a wide shot of the movie and you pull out to realize that you're watching a movie within a movie. And, uh, and again, there's a thematic element in that movie that is relevant to what's about to happen with Danny. Um, so Danny having 42 on his shoulder when he's in the bathroom in that first scene, um, you know, maybe that's related, but even if it's not, it's like the, any kind of reading that there's uh, violent and sexual uh, assaults happening within the family is not contingent on that. No. All right. So continuing, I guess. Oh, Brian, I just want, want to, I just want to, order, I want to offer a quick alternate. I like that, that explanation a lot, but an alternate explanation is Kubrick is telling us we're no longer dopes because he's going to, he's going to show us the truth about the moon landing. <laughs> also maybe plausible. Yeah. Um, all right. So going back, I guess over it, cause we got to probably, you know, wrap it up pretty fast. Um, a ball. So the ball rolls towards Danny um, and the door in 237 is open and he wanders into 237. Um, and then, and then see so at the same time you hear, uh, Jack screaming and, and Wendy's like kind of going around checking everything in the, in the hotel. And, uh, you know, she comes in to check on Jack and Jack says he has this dream that he hurt Danny or that he, uh, murdered Danny and her with an ax and he's like freaking out. And then Danny comes in as she's consoling him and has the, the choke marks on his neck as if he was hurt by somebody and won't talk about it. And, um, and, and so she blames Jack automatically for that um, because he's hurt him before, obviously. And that's when Jack wanders off into the, into the bar uh, room and is talking to Lloyd. And he's explaining that, you know, you did hurt Danny uh, years ago and, and you get the, the, like a fuller story, I guess a very similar um, a very similar telling of a fuller story of, um, you know, Danny going through his papers and, and Jack pulling him up and dislocating his shoulder. Um, and you get the contempt, I guess, the, 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 the sheer yeah. contempt that he has for everybody in his family at that yeah. point. Um, 
So I don't know if anyone wants to comment on anything in there. And then of course he also of course relapses um, in his head at least during that when uh, when Lloyd offers him a drink and he, you know, and and that's kind of the, also the scene that he um, you know pretty much get, like trades his soul to the devil. I guess he said he would trade his soul for a for a pint of beer, um, and he ends up drinking like a, a bottle of whiskey instead. Jim Beam. Yeah. <laughs> and Pepto Bismol. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in uh, in Cape Fear, that's what the, uh, the the private detective was drinking: Jim Beam mixed with Pepto Bismol. Which <laughs> sounds like the most like grotesque thing ever, but uh, like like it's it's, it's so weird. drink. It's the drink of summer twenty twenty one. That's the new thing. <laughs> <laughs> um. All right. So, uh. So then when so. Uh, he's told that it's room 237. I guess Wendy comes in and tells Jack that it's 237 that um, Danny now claims that he got hurt in. Um, and she asks Jack to check it out. And Jack kind of denies that anything could possibly go be going on, but walks into room 237. And that's when you get like, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what your guys is reading on this, whether she's supposed to be um, the wife of the former caretaker. Um, is that what? Uh, we, I mean, is that the, whatever, there's an old, there's a woman in the bathtub that seems to be, that, that's drowned. And then she comes out of the bathtub and, and walks towards uh, Jack and she's like a young woman and, and kisses him. And then as she, as you see from the mirror in the back, that the, the skin starts uh, falling yeah. off of her. And she's this grotesque older woman that's like cackling and walking towards him. And then as that's happening, it flashes towards her in the bathtub again, um, like drowned pretty much. Um any, any, I mean, uh, there's. I mean, I'd be curious what other people have to say about this, but this is, you know, most clearly, you know, a, a, on some level, like a dream sequence, in the sense that, like, you know, we all have dreams. I don't have dreams like that, obviously, but <laughs> we all, we all have dreams. David doesn't dream. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, when you see somebody and there's somebody, and then they become somebody else very quickly, right? And it's extremely jarring. Like this is very clearly. Uh, you know, a window into some kind of world that Jack is experiencing. Um, One thing yeah, I, I think that's interesting. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know that she could be like, I think if she was the wife of the previous caretaker, instead of just having her be like desiccated in the bathtub, we would see like axe wounds, right? Yeah. 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 So like, I, I, just I just didn't, I just never really, under, I just never really understood if I was missing it and if it was supposed to be somebody connected to the story or if it was kind of just its own standalone ghost. Uh. Yeah. I, 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 I think that there's a suggestion that like a lot of violent things have happened in this hotel over the years. So, mm -hmm. you know, like, I think that's probably separate, but, but also like to go to Kale's, you know, theory or what he's been developing about the sexual abuse, right? No, seriously. It's like, yeah. here, here's like an object of desire, right? That's extremely attractive at the beginning that then becomes, you know, on second look, something that's absolutely horrific, uh -huh. right? right. Um, so it's like his sexual desire is being recognized, maybe even by himself, as something that is is not just, um, you know, is something that is extremely perverse and and and, and wicked and, and scares even him. Like he's frightened by um, his, you know, his previous object, this this woman that he was very attracted to, of course, and always making out with her and all that kind of stuff, right? And then he gets scared by her. So one thing I think that's important to this that is interesting is that now, aside from the fact that we see Jack in room 237, Jack and Wendy never mention 237. They, they don't ever refer to that hotel uh, room mm. that Danny's the only one. Uh, he, he mentions it to Halloran and, um, and Halloran responds to him that like, there's nothing in there, but don't go in there. And it seems like a warning. Right. But Aside from Danny, like the adults don't know what that room is. And Wendy goes down to tell Jack, like there was a mm -hmm. crazy woman that strangled Danny. That's what he told me. Go up and check. She doesn't say what room. Why would he happen to go in that room? Um, and in fact, by the time that he comes back to Wendy in the Torrance apartment, he's completely calm, even though a moment earlier we saw him, you know, sweating bullets, like locking the, the door in the in two, three, seven. He walks in totally calm, like, I didn't see anything. Nope, nothing there. I think it's, I think it's plausibly, uh, I think 237 um, is a dream, and it's specifically Danny's dream. 
that yeah, she, Danny she does say, doesn't she, when, when he gets back, uh, Wendy, I think, says the room number a couple times. Well, because da Danny's um, told her. Danny, okay. Yeah, that's how he knows which room to go, and Danny says it was somebody, or she, he, she says to him that Danny said it was somebody in 237, I thought. No, no, when, well, at least when she goes up to, to Jack at the bar, she never says the room number. It's no, just, I don't, I don't a crazy think she, woman. I don't think she tells him initially, but when, when he gets back and they're talking about it, she says, are you sure it was, was that room 237? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I remember no, that too, I, but okay. I don't have the PhD, so I didn't want to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We're, we're layman here, so I don't, I don't, I don't want to copy. Uh, none of us, none of us shine, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we're... I'm looking at the director cut. You're looking at the rough cut. It's just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. no, fair enough. I mean, uh, like, the twenty like hour. Hale and Stanley Kubrick used to have whole conversations without opening their mouths. Well, that's what happens when you meditate hard enough. You know. You <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah. yeah so I, I think it, but I think it's Wendy or um Danny. Yeah, when, I think you're right for us that Wendy says that Danny told her. Um, so like the information is still coming from Danny, but nevertheless, I, it, the, the room itself is, I think a dream sequence, but it's, it's not just an arbitrary dream sequence. Like it's the, the room pattern, the way the, the rooms are, uh, connected to one another of living room, bedroom, bathroom is the same arrangement as in the, the Torrance apartment. Um, obviously it's a hotel, so you would expect some continuity between rooms, but there's certain, um, visual references that these are similar. The shower curtain in the in room 237 is very similar to the shower curtain that we see uh, in uh, the Torrance's Boulder apartment um, when Danny has the first uh, episode at the beginning of the movie. Um, there's these connections that this is something that Danny's experiencing. And although Jack is the one that's standing there, again, I think it makes sense to the again, if you're gonna if you're gonna strip it away of kind of the paranormal side, if, if you want to understand the movie through a different through this other lens, I think you can understand it. Yeah. So, um, uh, the shower curtain, like it's actually that you can see in the first shot of the the Boulder apartment that there's also it also kind of looks like there's someone sitting in the bathtub in a similar way that you can kind of see a figure here. Like, there's just it's like frame the same way it's supposed to look very similar it's supposed to kind of connect these these images uh you know from one to the other um what's interesting is that uh right this is the the bedroom <laughs> Some, yeah i'm looking yeah, no, I'm looking for the, um it should be danny bedroom or danny bathroom or something um uh, right here yeah yeah it's a very similar kind of bathtub um again we're looking through doors uh, and it's, so it's framed similarly, um, the, the mirrors on the right side of the room. It's, so there's all these kind of little hints, um, the, the pink and green, um, like, uh, uh, we were talking earlier with, with kind of the colors that reappear throughout the film. Um, anyways, what's interesting is that Jack has this experience with the woman, um, where, uh, you know, he ends up stumbling backwards. He's walking backwards out of the room. He's he's looking up at the woman. You get this kind of like shot that almost looks like it's from like a child's perspective. Um, and the walking backwards, I think, is significant here and then later that this becomes like a motif of, of how to kind of get out of these situations that uh, Jack, who again, I think is Danny in a dream, is walking backwards in order to lock the hag away in the room. Um, and this will parallel later when we see uh, Wendy walking backwards and then Danny walking backwards. Uh, so anyways, come back to that, but. All right. Um, be before, so, we, uh, be yeah. before we move on, by the way, I, I did just want to revisit the, the issue of what happens to, to Danny in the room because I, I I do see your point that I, I think that it is interesting that we don't actually see that. Like we, we see um, like we see Wendy, you know, very rationally assuming, you know, that, 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 uh, that Jack uh, hurt him. We see Jack looking shocked, although, you know, given his mental state, I think that's totally consistent with him having done it, but also um, 
but also he says specifically that there's a there's a crazy woman in the in right. the room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, how how quickly does Wendy just accept Danny's story? That as like she her immediate reaction is, Jack, you did this, you son of a bitch. And then Danny says apparently off screen that it was a crazy woman in one of the rooms. And so now she is parroting that to Jack of like, like you gotta go, you gotta, you have to be the one to go protect Danny. You have to be the one to uh, to deal with this woman. But I mean, and then Jack says later like if you rule out his story, you know, what's the other explanation? And he says it's because Danny did it himself, but could have been Jack, but that's never considered from her, like in that moment that well, she, she just, wants, she, well, imp- she wants Jack to, I mean, she wants to stay in that family unit. Like she, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's terrifying. Like she doesn't want to stay in that family unit necessarily like on a, on, you know, she's afraid of it, but she's also afraid of what what's happening outside. She wants him not to be abusive. You know what I mean? So it's like yeah. these rationalizations, yeah. these yeah. rationalizations of, oh, well, you know, Danny actually says it was this that happened. Like it, it has to be, um, you know, it, it's her like rationalizing like, oh, well, you know what? You know, Danny says it's something else. So it must be some like uh, another thing like that. That makes sense. Like, I don't want, uh, you know, I don't want to believe that my husband is capable of these things. Totally. There's like a denial of violence throughout the entire movie. I mean, from the very mm-hmm. beginning when, um, you know, the uh, Jack's employer just like flippantly says like, oh, yeah, you know, there have been some Native Americans who attacked while we were building this on a, you know, Native American burial ground. And it was just yeah. like such a flippant way to communicate that. Um and I think a lot of that also explains um, the imagery of like the blood splashing um, in that lower level elevator area, right? It's just, I think that symbolism was meant to draw attention to the fact that like, just to remind the audience, like the whole construction of this establishment um, is a denial of violence, right? Mm-hmm. Just like, yeah. And it's layers of it's- trauma. It's, mm-hmm. it's layered on trauma just from the get go, like just the the foundation of it, even before like even before a single, you know, a single uh, brick or you know piece of the foundation was laid. Like it's already a traumatic. There's something traumatic that occurred on it. Right. But this is also like but this is just these are just coping mechanisms that this is your body doesn't allow you to constantly experience traumatic events, even if they have happened to you because you wouldn't be able to function. You wouldn't be able to go through your, your daily life. And so this is kind of the contradiction that's apparent that like the people have to, we all, all like we live in America. Like this is a story about us basically. Like we go through these experiences personally and in a, a larger sociological context um, that like, you know, there's references to American empire throughout the movie. Uh, you know, we go through- White man's life, bird, my good man. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But we, so, but we just can't, we like physiologically can't focus on these things all the time. And that's why they end up getting buried in our subconscious. And that's what Kubrick is trying to say. Like, in order to actually overcome these and break certain reoccurring cycles, you necessarily are going to have to go back, go backwards and go through the trauma. And, and, yeah. No, I I, I just want, no, I just want to ask, um, you know, just like on the American imperialism aspect of the film, um, do you all think that there's much significance of the fact um, that the, the asshole, the stuffy asshole who's using the N-word, right, uh, the racist guy is like is British, right? Do you think that there's anything there or is it just like – or is that more to do with just like how we would imagine – you know, the kind of captain of the, of the hotel to be, would be a British person. Right. Well, there's kind of an I idea. That he, was there. he was there first too. Like, you know what I mean? Like he's kind of, he's kind of foundational in, in the hotel. Um, so it, it's kind of like the, the colonization, I guess, of it was mm-hmm. British first. So I could see that reading of it. I don't necessarily know how deeply to go into that, but like there is that, I, I could see that being a, a thing. Because I, I what I, what I'm trying to say is that like there's very clearly like the the story of genocide against Native Americans, but also like the racial narrative is is is, is pretty significant, right? They're, like the only other character who's I- I- at the end of it um, of the movie who's very much involved is 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 a black man who is oftentimes maligned using the most you know nasty words um, you could can imagine, right? Um, He's the only one who dies. 
Yeah, and he's the only, only one who dies. dies. In, the most, in the most horror movie trope kind of kind of way. Well, Jack dies, yeah. but like of his own. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, well, I don't. Okay. I, he's only killed, yeah. but yeah, yeah, killed. Yeah, I, I think that there's layers of violence and trauma. Like I think Anna's right about that. Um, I, I just think that you know we're we're seeing all of this. Like the hotel itself is just layers of of trauma, layers of violence, like ra- like racism and like genocide as a foundation of that too like but also when when jack says white man's burden like it's a reference to the native yeah. american thing but it's also a reference to the fact that you know he's the white patriarch of, of the family i think and like he's kind of saying like oh he's burdened by his family because he, before that he's talking about like you know like his wife holding him down pretty much well so, they also like, mentioned that the guests of the hotel too right are the jet set right so like the hotel is like a monument not just um yeah, you know, it's a monument to a part of the world that is not accessible to most folks. Mm-hmm. Um, and all people the best who people. Are, yeah, all, all the best, best people. <laughs> <laughs> the best kind of, and the brightest, if you will. That is kind of funny that uh, Kubrick ended up making Eyes Wide Shut because, like, you know, the, the flippant way he says all the best people, like, is, is you know, it, like, the, the subtext of it, it really is there. Like, <laughs> um. um. I don't want to. I don't want to jump ahead um, if you guys aren't ready for it. But as we're talking about all of this, it just kind of. It, I mean, obviously, it's up for interpretation still. But I, I think about that final scene, like the real enigma that I think left audiences guessing about, like what the meaning was. And I have a theory on it, but I. I, I don't want to jump uh, to it until you guys are ready for it. All right. So I mean, we could go through this pretty fast. Um, you know, yeah. it's it climaxes pretty quickly. I think. Um, but so we're, we're at the part where uh, he gets back to, to Wendy and he says nothing's going on in room 237. You know, it must have been something that Danny made up. Um, and then, uh, you know, what, that's the first time Wendy really suggests, like, they need to leave the hotel and take Danny to a doctor. He's clearly, like, injured. Somebody did something to him. Um, and, and that's when, like, like um, that's when Jack is like, we can't leave the hotel and starts blaming pretty much everything bad in his life on, on his wife and her holding him down and like, you know, like, so, um, yeah, so that's when he enters that, that like 1920s party. That's clearly like another dream sequence that he's, um, regressing into and the, the Grady spills, um, spills avocado on his shirt, which I was pretty, uh, amazed learning is not avocado. It's a kind of liquor. I, I, I don't know. I just didn't know what, I've never heard the term avocado before. <laughs> I was like, this is a weird way to say avocado. Um, but so, <laughs> So, so they're, um, yeah, so that's when they go into the bathroom and he's saying, he's telling Delbert Grady, like, oh, like, aren't you the one that murdered your family? And, uh, as, as the former caretaker and he's like, no, like, like you're the caretaker. You've always been the caretaker. And, um, but, but then like, but then like 90 seconds later, he starts talking about killing his family. Yeah. He had to, he had to correct them. <laughs> um, yeah. So he's kind of basically suggesting to Jack that it's time that he murders his family as well. Um, and that's kind of where the climax of the movie starts. Um, and then, so, it, I, and I guess uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? We kind of just touched on the the part where, you know, he drops the the N-word in that to refer to, you know, um, talking to, like, like the, the Dick Halloran and uh, shining communication that he has with, um, yeah, with Danny. Um, I don't know. So any, 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 any thoughts on that? Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to say parenthetically, I, I, like I always think it's kind of funny that like we've, uh, and, and this is a good thing, right? Like that we, we've done such a good job as a society of uh, stigmatizing like the overt expression of racism, uh, if not always, you know, uh, you know, less overt expressions of it uh, that like, you know, that we get these things like, you know, we start, uh, it's like, oh yeah, no. And he, uh, you know, just before he told, Jack to murder his family. He said the N word. Right? Like, that's like, 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 there, like there, there is something, you know, a little bit funny about that. Look, but, the guy, uh, the guy murdered his family, but he's also kind of a racist. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a isn't very, that the real crime here? <laughs> yeah, death by cancellation. Um, so, <laughs> like the way I interpreted that scene was, he was, he has such disdain for his family. And he was looking for any sort of validation to cause them physical harm or Mm. murder them, really. Like, it was just hearing what he wanted to hear. Um, And 
yeah, I think that's that's what that scene um, represented, really. Like just just some sort of um, go ahead, a green light. Like, no, 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 this is the right thing to do. You hate them. You want to murder them. So go ahead, murder them. Yeah, right. and, it's and also, it's funny. It's the most, yeah. Yeah. It's I, the I, most I, obvious I, example of uh, Jack looking in the mirror and talking to himself. Because if you look, I don't have a good still of this, but like if you look at that scene, Jack's eyeline, like the eyeline of actors, like you want their eyes to match up, um, you know, and sometimes the way you block a, a shot, you, you know, someone might be a little bit off to, it's not a perfect what, looking directly at each other, they might be staggered. So you just want to make sure the eyes look like they're looking at each other. But in the shot, it's very clear that Jack's eyes are not looking at Grady. Like they are very obviously looking in the mirror. He's look, like, he, they even do a close up when like he's just clearly looking in the mirror the entire time. It's so, a hotel to the, full to of Anna's mirrors. comment. Like it's a hotel yeah. full of like there's mirrors everywhere in that hotel. Like and also they've they purposely put in the beginning like people that look like Jack and like the family as like mirror images of them kind of going through the hotel as guests, which I, I think is is interesting because on so many levels there's like a theoretical part of it and like a, a, a literal part of it, which of course the most you know the the biggest manifestation of it is the fact that Grady has a different name. Um you know, yeah. as a ghost than he did as the caretaker. Shit, we, we forgot the twins. <laughs> we skipped the twins. <laughs> <laughs> like the most iconic part, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't think that they were very interesting ghosts. <laughs> ghosts. Nah, nah. I prefer... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I prefer here, ghosts. Here. I'm sorry. It's window dressing. <laughs> well, you know, so... Uh, the, there there were theories, I don't know if we want to get into this, but there was some stuff about how um, the twins represented like some sort of desire that Wendy has. I'm not really sure mm. I follow any of that, but um, mm. if anyone has any thoughts, um, I'm curious to hear it. I've never... Well, I don't know about that, but I, I'd be curious. Like, for me, seeing the twins was such a moment of having never seen this movie before. of just be like, oh, well, I get the meme now. Right, like, yeah, totally, hundred yeah, yeah, yeah. percent. So many pop yeah. culture references. I mean, obviously, when I saw yeah. them, I was like, "Oh, this is referencing something." But like, oh, now I get this is from yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Come play with this, Danny. Like, it's super <laughs> iconic. And and it's funny. I feel like movies like this with like so many iconic scenes. And I also feel this way about like I don't know. There's a whole bunch of movies that like are are older that I feel this way about. Like, it's so many memes at some point that if you see it after you've seen all the memes, it's like. Almost it's like, like another meme. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's like it's like a retread of things you've already yeah. seen, but then you think about it, you're like, oh wait, all of those things come from this originally. Yeah. Right. This, well, is this movie is really derivative. It's like, derivative. <laughs> of, it's always sunny in Philadelphia. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the, I mean, so I mean, the, the thing is uh, the uh, the twins saying, you know, telling Danny and you know, and yeah, I mean it, it is uh awesomely creepy i mean just just something about like the the two little kids you know sort of doing sing song unison uh but uh to play uh, with us you know forever and ever uh you know which which uh whatever you know was going on at the end we'll get anna's theory about that in a couple of minutes but uh the uh like the this like it does it is one of many things in the movie where there's some suggestion that like whatever being sucked into or surrendering to the hotel means is some kind of like eternal or timeless state. You know, there's uh, uh, the one we already talked about, you know, which is um, uh, I, you know, no, Mr. Torrance, you have always been the caretaker. You know, I've always been the Butler. Um, and, uh, and then of course, you know, there's the actual end of the movie. Right. Yeah. The, um, so it's it's interesting that uh, I mean, because Forrest, your comment that like they they look they become pretty iconic for this movie, but also like Kubrick is basing them off of uh, a Diane Arbus photo from 1967 that was already fairly well known. That like so it's it's already a reference to something else. Um, one of the one of the weird things that happened, and you mentioned um, Kubrick's daughter Vivian had shot a documentary of the film. In the documentary. Kubrick invites James Mason on. James Mason is um, the lead actor. He plays the pedophile in Lolita. Um, and he's introducing James Mason to, to uh, Jack Nicholson on the set of The Shining, um, which it's an odd thing to include in your making of documentary. But James Mason has two daughters, and they look like their ages 10 and 8. 
and they, one of them turns to the camera and it looks just like one of the twins. And the other daughter, the younger daughter, has on the, like the light blue, the sky blue dress. And so it's just a weird detail. I don't, I don't, I'm not want to, I don't want to say this is where Kubrick got the idea for the twins, but like it's just a weird thing that is a part of the the making of that, like the pedophile from Lolita is speaking to Jack Torrance and the girls who kind of look like the twins are there. And um, anyways, and also like uh, at the beginning, uh, we're told that the the previous caretaker killed his daughters who were around 10 and, and eight, but then we have identical twins appearing in the, in the hotel that there's like weird discrepancies like that that shouldn't be there. But um, I don't know what that means. But what I, m one of my interpretations of like the twins ultimately and this comes back to the line that you just said when they when they say come play with us danny forever and ever and ever when jack when danny sits on jack's lap in he the says, scene in the middle, yeah he it, uses he's, exactly the same phrase jack says uh that i love this place i would love to live here forever and ever and ever and it's this creepy rep repetition and so Part of how, again, because I, I think I understand Tony as like a split part of Danny, that Danny is seeing people speaking at the same time. It, it kind of, it's like a, an allusion to uh, 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 multiple personality disorder or, or disassociative um, personality disorder that Danny is a child that has faced immense trauma already and is about to face even more. And there's this like fear that Kubrick's putting in of like, he might end up as someone who is just permanently traumatically damaged. And, and oftentimes children that uh, are sexually abused end up with disassociative identity disorder. Yeah. So it's, it's this, and, again, and even, it's, even, it's ones that, even children that aren't, um, even children that aren't necessarily affected with that. Um, like there's a part of their brain that compartmentalizes it, I guess. And it's like, almost like it splits off. Like, it, just to function in daily life, like children that were sexually abused, like have to kind of turn that part of their brain off and it kind of creates like a split compartment um, yeah. of, the, so, of the brain. High functioning, uh, you know, sometimes it can be like, it's like survival skills. And that's exactly what Tony is. Like that is the split part in Danny that is uh, enabling him to navigate being stuck in the hotel with his dad. Um, so anyways, just wanted to throw that little tidbit in there. <laughs> yeah. All right. So going through it, I guess, uh, faster. So we, we have the part where, you know, Dick Halloran is trying to get in, like trying to get to the hotel or get in contact with them somewhere. And, uh, of course, you know, Grady has just said, oh, your son is trying to contact an, an outside party, bring an outside party into the situation. So we kind of see Dick Halloran making this trip, um, from Florida to Colorado, um, to say, like, I mean, you know, in, in his mind to save them. And uh, I think, you know, the fact that that ends so violently and destructively is like a, a very like there is no saviors type of, uh, you know, kind of theme. But uh, I'll get to that later, I guess. Um, so so Wendy grabs the baseball bat and she's looking for Jack and she wants to leave the hotel with her without him. Pretty much. She's still not ready to completely let go of him. Like if he's just like, oh, like, let's leave the hotel. Like she's willing to do it. But she's she's kind of standing up for Danny. Um at this point and uh you know that's when she enters the the ballroom and looks down at the the typewriter and we see the famous uh all work and no play make jack a dull boy written over and over and then with like different you know errors and um i don't know is do we have that as one of the we have to right as one of the <laughs> i don't um, know if i do actually yeah we do hold on we... oh there we go yeah never mind of course we do like this is I, like what most of my manuscripts are. Like, <laughs> for left reckoning. <laughs> so yeah. it's, it's interesting yeah, because some of the pages like, uh, are formatted like a screenplay. If you when yeah. you go through the pages, mm -hmm. yep. but they're He's also really like having formatted writers like those pages. little star poems you learned how to do when you're a kid. Like you know, you can do. I can't remember what the term is for, it, but you know, poetry where you make like a diamond or something like that too. You know, they say somewhere in one of those stacks of paper, it says uh, Kubrick faked the moon landing. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, th that this is part of the theory that it's not all work and no play. It's a one one work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. 
which is stupid oh, because God. that is the letter L on, in Courier, the font. Like that's not <laughs> that's not the one key. If if he wanted to say Apollo Eleven work makes, <laughs> like it, it would have been oh, a <laughs> number one, number one. It's it again. It's yeah. a stupid theory that's grasping at straws. But. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but but this, this does explain a lot. You know, I remember like a year and a half ago, David telling me that he was writing this big essay about populism and, uh, you know, it was like taking him a really long time. And I thought, oh, where's that essay? You know, again, like, <laughs> you know somewhere. I I'll send it, it to you, man. It's pretty it's good. Now. It's about, it's about 10,000 words of just <laughs> <laughs> Texas, 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 Texas. <laughs> All right. So, uh, so no, Wait, this okay. is weird. one more one more thing on the yeah. typewriter because <laughs> i think this is like again but like this is jack's frustration that's coming out that like this is the english version they also recorded a couple other versions with different languages and they're all just kind of idioms that are like about feeling like you can't get started or i would say get off but uh in the in the type in the in some of what's typed a couple times on one page um, I know this is really kind of in the weeds, but on one page, he several times writes, instead of all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, he writes all work and no play makes Jack adult boy, as in an adult. Mm. And someone has pointed out that the L and the T keys are too far for that to be a mistake, that this was something someone manually typed, that mm. like this, and this is the thing that Jack is in the movie, an adult boy. Like he acts mm -hmm. like a boy. He's like, that's his relationship with Wendy effectively. Um, and again, I, I think he ends up sleeping with a boy in the movie, but that's the, like, it's this weird little, like other little thing that comes up. And even if you don't take that, it's just like the, the amount that he's typing of just this monotonous phrase, like it's just constant frustration that he's experiencing. I'd like to believe that there's like a Dutch version of it where it's like all of work and no, uh, like all field of work and, and no frolicking makes Jack this old boy. Like, <laughs> I, ju I just get the yeah. sense that Jack hates himself. Like, yeah. that's what I get from that. He hates his life. He hates his family. But more importantly, he hates himself and he recognizes um, how much of a failure he is, you know, yeah. um, for a number of different reasons. Right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, there's the precariousness of, of his, um, I guess, economic or career situation. There's the fact that he hates his family. It's the fact that he can't. I mean, he's literally pr like pushed his family into mm. living in this incredibly creepy hotel that's empty for months and months so he can write. And clearly he's failing. He's failing at writing. Mm -hmm. And so it's just to me, it just kind of oozed like this self, this self hate. Yeah. And here's a thought experiment. You know, put yourself in an isolated hotel for 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 five months. Can you write? This well, this proves free will. <laughs> I think and I, I think like like the self-hate is certainly there. Like Anna's hundred percent right. And like like the fantasy too, right? Because this is such a psychological movie, like the fantasy of like being a writer. Um, is this kind of fantasy that like Oh, I have such like a rich, like interpersonal self, right? Like I have such a rich understanding of everything around me um, that I, if I just put this on paper, it will be of value to other folks, right? And there's a reason that there's a kind of craziness that goes with writing because it is like putting yourself up in a room and spending a lot of time like with your own thoughts and then putting that on paper as he does right there and realizing that it's sucks and it's also very crazy um is something that is like you know it's not surprising that that would make somebody go a little nuts right so like try to put like this passion onto paper and realize that there's not really much there jack needs an editor yeah you know? <laughs> he needs more than an editor i, think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I imagine that, like an editor i i imagine that, like like PMC liberal journalists like see that and they think that's what Substack looks like to them. Like, just... <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I do want right. to know because like I mentioned this earlier that like so two things. One, this is this scene of of Jack appearing and and basically like a, you know stalking down uh, uh, Wendy, just like marching towards yeah. her all the way up the stairs. 
is um, it has the most takes of any scene in movie history. That it's I think is 127 takes, meaning that like they just kept doing that scene over and over and over and over again, which it's fucking brutal. Like I, I imagine like some of the takes they use are probably from the end of it where the actors are just completely exhausted. But um, the, the other thing is that, again, I think it's significant that during this confrontation, when Wendy really just has to deal with the fact that her husband is a lunatic that is uh, aggressive and, and wants to like hurt her and Danny, it takes her literally walking backwards and finally walking up the stairs to a higher place where she can finally swing the bat and hit him. And, and again, just on its own, whatever, but this, there's this motif of like, in order to progress, in order to make sense of what's going on and accept reality, you have to go backwards first. Mm -hmm. mm. All right. So you've, you've done a good job, uh, you know, going to, into what's next. So I feel good about not having to <laughs> explain that part. Oh, oh, anyone else have any more thoughts on, on the scene i just i just want to say like i think this scene in the movie is extremely powerful i'm very much like a team wendy person oh yeah you know all the way through this well, I mean, no, obviously, I, well, obviously we all are rooting for wendy yeah. because jackson monster no but this scene I would is actually amazing. like to talk to a pro jack person uh just to know no but like i think that scene is like and i think the fact that they spent so long like creating that is 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 really crucial um because it's such a powerful scene for her. Um, and as I was saying like earlier in the stream, it's like she recognizes the danger of him the entire time. Oh, yeah. And this is just like the cinematic realization of her dealing with the fear that we're seeing and then her doing something about it, actually, like in, you know, in reality versus just being something that she experiences. Um, so I don't know. It's a, it's a really it's a really critical scene in the movie, obviously for the story, but also like the way that it's shot and it, it shows her understanding all the way back through the entire movie of how much of a danger that Jack is. That you know, come, I mean, seriously, like this is somebody who you're married to, right? That you have a child with, you have a life with, and you can just so quickly recognize this person is a present danger to myself and to my child. That takes a very serious, um, you know, character to be able to do. A lot of people, even with all of the information that you know she has at that moment, would run away from that situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, she, she recognizes that he's a danger. She's not sure what to do about it, you know, which is sort of what's yeah. been, um, you know, like in the. Uh, well, that's what's so brave. Sorry, not to cut you off, man, but like yeah. that's what's so brave is because a lot of people like. They see something like, oh, I recognize this. I don't know what to do about it, so I won't do anything. I'm just going to sit and wait, right? She does something right there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just yeah, thinking. not only that. I mean, she drags his body. I mean, drags his body into that, um, you know, storage room or that pantry. <laughs> like, I was terrified. That part terrified yeah. me because oh, God, he's, like, yes. starting to wake yeah. up. You know, you yeah. see him foaming at the mouth. And yeah. I was just like... Wendy, stay strong, girl. Yeah. Stay strong. Pull <laughs> yeah. him in there and, close and she the does. Door. She sticks with it, which is yeah, it's really impressive. Yeah, and, and when <laughs> and when and when he's saying like Wendy, Wendy, oh my when, god, like, yeah. that, you you would think that at other parts of like other times in her life when she's not making this big decision, like no, this is where I put my foot down. This is where I take a stand. That she probably would give in and go, all right, like you know, maybe I'm overreacting. Like you know what I mean? Like like rationalize it to herself and then let him out. But like the fact that this this goes on and on and on and she finally is able to walk away and break away is that like triumphant moment for her. Like yes. even this even this like I mean, it's not a small it's a huge victory, but like yeah. even even maybe not killing him and just leaving him in there and like closing the door to it is is a um you know, I think is a is a really impressive uh, metaphor, I guess. Mm. Horace, can you pull up the photo of the storeroom uh, with Wendy's reaction? Sure. Um, Cause right, this is exact. This is right after she's she's pulled Jack in. He's now woken up, and he she's now locked the door and is looking back at the door, talking mm -hmm. to him. She's kind of breaking down a bit, and is like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna go uh, with Danny, and I'll come back with a doctor to help you." Um, what's just a small little fun detail about this is that 
on the table in the background is a box of Frosted Flakes with Tony the Tiger watching everything that's going on. Amazing. <laughs> like, wow. again, why, mm. why, why do they put a box of Frosted Flakes in the back of this scene overlooking her shoulder watching this happening? I think it's, it's supposed to be the movie. He's watching. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was just going to say, you know, the Simpsons parody, you know, uh, had like, like had a little bit of fun with the fact that like, she really is in this impossible situation because she's clearly not ready to, uh, to kill him. Uh, but uh, what's plan B, right. You know, that like yeah. so she doesn't have, uh, you know, like a method of, uh, of, of escape, you know, at, at that point. And, you know, and it, it would, it would take so long for anybody to get up there. So uh, in the uh, Simpsons Treehouse of horror version, you know, when Marge dumps uh, uh, Homer in the pantry, she says, you stay here until you're no longer insane. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's, and uh, I love uh, talking about the fairy. Then he's just happy to stand there. He's got all the food. So the ghosts have to like literally drag him out of the pantry. <laughs> 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 all right yeah, so um, yeah yeah so that's when so this is when she sees that the the snow cat uh is is like he's like i've got us you're gonna be surprised like so the snow cat no longer works they have no escape route and then jack is is uh roused from a nap by delbert grady who um is saying that he doesn't believe his heart is truly in this because he hasn't murdered his family yet and uh you know he's, he's like oh i can i can do this and and that's when that's the moment that that uh, the pantry door unlocks, and of, of course, you don't really see that it's Grady necessarily that unlocked it, but you do mm. you see it open, and you uh, hear it open. You don't see it yeah. open. Yeah. Um. So, all right. So then, so then they don't know that Wendy and Danny don't know that uh, Jack is out, and that's the, the this is the really fucking creepy scene where she's asleep and the door is locked in the room, and Danny's like back in the trance as as Tony. And is saying red rum, red rum, red rum, <laughs> red rum for like three fucking minutes, and it gets no. louder and louder and louder, holding the knife until she finally wakes up. Um, uh, and then that's when you see the like red rum is murder because she looks into the mirror, which the mirror again, obviously, and then it's the, mm. it's the murder with the R back, which I mean, I don't know, classic, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah, that scene was weird because like, how do you? How do you take a quick nap like after after that whole traumatic experience with your husband? But anyway, I don't, I don't know if that means anything. I doubt it, but it was just strange. Yeah, she's waking yeah. up the truth. <laughs> OK, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, it's, it, it is kind of weird, but I guess we could just minimally say maybe she was exhausted that this was like a, her, you know, a really traumatic experience for her. And, uh, and also she had to drag jack's body through the hotel and so now yeah. she's just kind of she collapsing just, she just shuts down after that yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah all right so um you know so then you hear jack swinging the axe and uh and she grabs danny and they go into the bathroom and she um you know pushes danny <laughs> to the window and she tries to she tries to get out the window which of course another winnie the pooh reference is that famous picture of winnie the pooh stuck in the cave when you can't get out um mm. And so, so Jack's like getting through the door and that's the, you know, the, the thing that everybody has a poster of in college or whatever, where it's uh, Jack Nicholson's face peering through the door. He goes, here's Johnny. And it's like, the, I've seen so many of those posters in people's yeah. fucking houses. Um, also and, a great moment in the parody when Homer keeps getting the wrong room. He's like, it's David Letterman. <laughs> Tonight at 60 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we watched, also we watched Cape Fear and he was watching that movie that was referencing um, The Shining and it was like, here's daddy or whatever. And that's the thing that <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Was laughing at in Cape yeah, Fear yeah. when he's going insane yeah. uh, the first mm -hmm. time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you hear the snow. So you hear the snow cat pulling up, and and it's Dick Halloran, and uh, he's he's walking inside, and we've we've witnessed him go from the plane, like from Florida to the plane, to calling on the phone from the airport to get the snow cat, to driving to get the snow cat five hours, finally getting it, and of course he finally shows up in this triumphant moment, and uh, and he's looking around, and, and you can't see anybody there, and then you know just as he's calling out, Jack runs up and hits him with the axe and kills him pretty much instantly. Um, which yeah, is kind of which, is, which is, I think, one of the biggest plot differences with the novel, because mm -hmm. uh, in the novel, 
uh, Halrand uh, survives to the end of the movie, you know, to the end of the book. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and in fact, I think like the very last scene of the novel is like him and Wendy and Danny together in Florida. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that seems very like Stanley Kubrick that, you know, that like, just, just that like brutal futility that like, you know, we, we spend like 40 minutes of the movie getting him in there and then he just <laughs> killed right away. Yeah. Yeah. But he served yeah. his purpose, though. He got the snow cat up there so they could they could get out. But it's also just the you know the, the idea that there are no saviors. Like this yeah. is not something that someone's going to rescue you out of. This is mm-hmm. you know the abusive situation you're in is um is something that you're going to have to get yourself out of or you know face yourself. Like if someone isn't just going to come um magically and like rescue you after traveling all that distance. Um, so, so this is a, a this is earlier in the film. This is right before Jack is over. He's looking at the um, the maze model, uh, which you can see to the right. But he's like throwing the tennis ball around the hotel, um, and you can see on the ground there's a black teddy bear covered in red in the exact position that ha- that Halloran is going to end up in at the end of the movie. Hmm. Oh wow! Like, weird little things like that of like there's some foreshadowing of of what's to come and and again this you know danny with the bears and now also halloran with a bear yeah all right so um so yeah so that's when wendy's running through the uh wendy's running through the through the hotel and then she finally begins to see um she finally begins to see the the ghosts that everybody else has been seeing throughout it and i don't think there's no moment that she sees the the ghosts or whatever before that um, i don't think so she's kind of she's kind of faced her trauma and now she can see like the 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 express trauma i think of the hotel itself and you know that's when you get the 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 picture that you so nicely uh sent us of the um the bear costume guy who's uh yeah, you know kind of sucking off the the guy that might be the yeah. The 1923. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, but obviously he's not actually giving, as as you said, sucking him off, he, because it's a <laughs> it's a it's it's clearly metaphorical because it's a, it's a full mask. So yeah. what's yeah. interesting? There's another photo I sent you, um, uh, two down from this called Bear Big Wheel. <laughs> you can find that one. That. It's funny because the costume on the mouth of the bear resembles what Danny looks like from behind on the trike with the helmet hair and this kind of like star shape of his arms and the wheels. It's a little detail. I I mean, yeah. It's a little bit of a stretch, but like it's also, I think thematically it fits in with a a bigger theme. So it's kind of take it or leave it, but yeah, that that one's a little more of a stretch maybe. Um, Yeah. I don't know. I don't, I think this is kind of just foreshadowing uh, eyes wide shut. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I'm gonna make this movie in a few years. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> so um, yeah. So she's running through. She sees everything. She sees the skeleton. She sees the the past trauma of the hotel kind of expressed in front of her. And uh, then you see Danny running through the maze. And Jack is Jack has made it out, and he's following Danny around the maze, screaming screaming to to danny and you know it's terrifying thinking about uh (laughs) thinking about thinking about you know someone's father running through them like this and screaming like like danny danny like like and so he so he has to start running through because he doesn't want his father to follow the footsteps that he's kind of left throughout so he has to find an alternate route throughout it and then i guess this is kind of a a part where you have to wonder like you know if tony is a self or is subconscious is is he being led through his self subconscious because like he's kind of number one i mean he's facing he's finally facing his father and like in a way that he's brought his father out into the open and he can finally kind of defeat him but at the same time you know at the subconscious level of it like he's kind of practiced in in this maze he's kind of um seeing the model of the maze like i guess is his subconscious kind of leading him through mm. or is it kind of a sub uh, a supernatural force almost like the shining leading him through and allowing him to finally um defeat his father uh, I guess is an interesting like because because you see it because you see him running and you see it in front of him like it's clearly showing you where he is going to go um, throughout the maze like you know so I I don't know what you guys think about that but um yeah so they're going deeper and deeper into the maze oh, David did you have something 
Oh, I mean, I think we can probably, you know, go forward. I'm just saying it's like, it's so funny for a movie that is so deep, like The Shining is, that like at the end of it, maybe not when we talk about the time travel twist that we get the last bit, but it's very edible, right? Um, And this is not a unique insight for me. I'm just saying like, it's almost funny that a movie that has so many twists and turns and all of these like subtle like aspects to it, there's a very like Oedipus complex, you know, scenario being sort of put right in our faces. Mm -hmm. It almost feels like a taunt by by Cooper at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Well, but again, the, the, we see three times in the movie, someone walking backwards from a threat and trapping uh, the threat in something. So the first time is, is Jack in room 237 stepping backwards from the, the, you know, the decaying woman and, and then locks the key and runs away. Wendy is stepping backwards until she finally hits Jack and then locks him away in the storage room. And then finally, Danny, uh, again, whether you think he is being chased by Jack into the middle of the maze, or if you think, I, I mean, I think it's plausible that Jack is lead or that Danny is leading Jack into the middle of the maze and then walking backwards and successfully trapping his father in the maze so that he can get out to safety. But it's it's this reoccurring theme of like the way that you like overcome this horrific, uh, just this, this um, in all three cases, it's, it's like an actual person that is charging at them or is, uh, you know, attempting to, to hit them, hurt them. Uh, it's this backtracking that leads to what they need to finally do in order to escape that situation and leave these entities, these people trapped in a way that is um, at the very least neutralizes the threat. Cause ultimately we know in the first case, the, the woman is it's amb- ambiguous, obviously what happens to her uh, Jack gets out of the storage room. And then the final Jack um is presumably killed that it you know he, there's a body that's frozen to death at the very end of the movie sorry mm-hmm. forrest i'm doing your job but mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so I mean, uh, yeah yeah i mean could it i'm just throwing something out there but could it mean that um in order to conquer your demons um you kind of have to backtrack um and mm. You know what I'm saying? Like you kind of have to go back and and address things um, wow. and and come to terms with it uh, before right. you can actually conquer those demons. No, exactly. I mean, that's that's the whole principle behind something like psychoanalysis. That's the whole yeah. that like people who have experienced trauma throughout their lives, it doesn't necessarily go away. It's stuck in your subconscious mm-hmm. and that you can't actively consciously uh, just disregard it or get rid of it part of the process of healing is that process of going back and actually facing these things and mm. addressing them. But it's, a, it's not, it's to go forward. You actually have to literally go back in the past first or to look into your memory. And I think, I think a thing that kind of goes on along the same lines is the fact that, you know, until the end of the movie, like Wendy can't even see the same ghosts, like the, you know, ghosts that like both Danny and Jack are seeing throughout the course of the movie. Like, She's kind of just processing all of it. Uh, she's processing everything through the other two characters, which you don't really think about, I guess, mm-hmm. until that moment. Like, you, you know what I mean? Like, just seem like, oh, yeah, like, you know, there's things going on that are strange, but not, none of the things that are strange, really. She's experiencing the strange things through them. Mm-hmm. And then upon locking Jack in that storeroom, taking that stand, all of a sudden, all of the secrets of the, of the uh, hotel come pouring out to her as she runs through it and she's running, she's retreading through the hotel at that point. And she's seeing, you know, like all these things that she didn't see before because she was kind of denying the essential truth that her husband and you know, her, her husband's abusing her son. Like, mm-hmm. and he's well, stopped. I, I like this line of thinking a lot and I hope uh, comrade Ben will forgive me nonetheless on his own show and also on his birthday for, you know, diving a little bit deep into like Lacan and 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 Freud on this, but like it is an interesting way to read this movie. Cut his mic. Cut his mic. Sorry, Lacan. Yeah, you were saying. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Freud, you were saying. It's an interesting way to read this movie um, in the sense of almost something. So, like, 
obviously time is a big part of this film, right? And there's a big question of like, oh, is this happening concurrently? Is there some kind of time travel aspect? Are there ghosts or whatever, right? But you, if you take the read of this, that this might be sort of Danny on some level understanding this horrible thing that happened to them later. Because people misunderstand Freud and like the interpretation of dreams, right? People misunderstand that and they're like, oh, well, if this thing happens in your dream, this means that, right? Well, while what Freud was articulating and then what Lacan really ended up articulating even better um, was that the point is not to say like, oh, well, this symbolizes this and this symbolizes that, but to say, why does your brain, why does your unconscious like treat these things in this way, right? Like, why does this represent this to you in your dream? Like, it's not necessarily trying to say like, oh, we're going to interpret dreams in the sense of like, oh, this is universal, but rather understanding the logic of why you dream the way that you do, if that makes sense, right? Um, and doing that with The Shining is, is extremely rich. Um, and it's a great, I'm sorry. I'm like, this is like a new tool for me because I haven't watched the shining. Before. Like, <laughs> I knew you were going to geek out, David. This, right. <laughs> so I'm saying like, it's exciting to say like, oh, this is a really cool way to like think about this film is like, this is a child trying to understand a horrible thing that happened to them in their past through a lot of things that might seem incoherent if you just watch them thematically as a film. But if you look at them on the other side of seeing what and understanding what we understand, you know, on the other side, oh, these things represent this and this represents that. And we can spend a lot of time continuing to go back to this and, and revisiting it to understand it. Um, but like, I don't know, we were texting last night and Kale was saying like the only way to do this film is through psychoanalysis. And for me, I think like that's the richest way to watch this film, because if you spend too much time to be like, oh, is this is this a, a time travel film? Is this a ghost film? Is this a horror film? I don't know. Like, if that's worthwhile to you and it's fun for you, I think that's good. But I, I don't think you're going to be satisfied. I think doing that kind of psychoanalytic reading is like is very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. Yeah, and, and I think it's probably more relevant in a way because as, as like fun as it is to speculate about the other stuff, like you know, there's there's a pretty straightforward sense in which like there just is no right answer about what literally happens in the movie because you know it's by definition anything that's not you know you're not shown in the movie right like you know like it's it's not you know it's it's not there you know in the uh you know there's 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 just nothing that's going to resolve this for you but um but the in um you know but like whatever is supposed to be literally true i mean clearly it is about these larger things like this like whether whether there's stuff that is on the um you know whether there's a supernatural plot that's representing that or like mm. ultimately a non-supernatural plot that's representing it you know i mean like that's you know i mean that's that's probably less interesting at the end of the day mm -hmm. i mean it is it is what you see is what you get to some extent obviously um but and and me kind of in bringing up a lot of this I, it's just it's me trying to understand why so many people obsess over this movie because i think it's just that they see that there's more to it than there is and then don't understand like it's this constant they end up falling into a maze themselves trying to like understand every little detail to pull it out and say oh well, he's, he's trying to communicate this to me is it everybody fa falling into this maze and overanalyzing it or is it just you <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh no I, I mean i think there is like um like i i think the stuff you were saying about the the backstory with with danny i, th I think that is very plausibly like um like the playgirl thing if nothing else like you know seems like a pretty good indication that it's at the very least kubrick wants you to wonder about that yeah, yeah. i i think that kale's reading of it is completely uh plausible and probably the correct one um I, I mean at least in the sense that there's some sexual abuse or something that happened because the way that oh, they yeah. say it's, oh, is like is he hurting you is such like a um i don't know it, it's just such a psychologically like like vague way of of putting that you know and he's like mm -hmm. oh i would never hurt him like like the way that he puts through like i don't know so i think that having it as like a psycho psychoanalytical framework is 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 the way to go yeah um kale's converted but, me with one but you can but again like it's that to me like that's just still one half of this thing that like they're talking about how trauma affects 
individuals within families, but obviously there's also the massive amount of trauma that people face within a society that is that has hierarchies, that has uh, exploitation and oppression mm. and and domination and genocide. Like I like there's all of that that's also there too. And like and what's interesting is like there is kind of like a a naturalistic way of putting both of these things together to say like there's a something that is uh, there's a through line between both of them that the way that you deal with these things is necessarily going back and and like yeah. actually dealing with the actual trauma um, rather than just kind of pushing through, continuing to go in circles and circles. Yeah. Well, so so on the subject of, of going back, I mean, do, do you want to do like uh, what's uh, what's going on at the end? Oh, I don't know. Um, um, no. Uh, <laughs> so, so, so it's, it sounded like Anna had a, had a theory earlier. Yeah. 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 So, um, so it ends with, I mean, Forrest, do you want to explain what it ends with? Yeah. Or do you want me to do yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can do it and I can cue it up, I guess. Um, so, <laughs> so finally Wendy makes her way out of the hotel, just as Danny makes his way out of the maze and, uh, Jack is trapped in the maze forever and ever and ever at least until he, somebody finds him in the maze anyway um and so he 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 is like running around i i found it one of the most like sinister things is like him kind of like when he limps through the maze and he's like singing like he, he's just so far gone that he's like like singing and like moving in such a like grotesque way as they drive the the um the snow cat away from it and also there's kind of something humorous and like the way that he said like san francisco when he like i kept thinking of like country roads like he like like he's running around the maze seeing country roads for the rest of his <laughs> existence but so he so he's so basically it flips and he's frozen to death um within the maze he can never get out of it because you know of course he can't he, like he can never heal that trauma that he's caused other people and you know they've broken away from him instead of vice versa so like he's forever frozen in, in that maze and um so then it kind of fades away and then you see uh it, it slowly fades towards a, a picture in the hotel where he's standing in front of a whole party of guests and it's that 1920s party again and he's at the front of everybody like this um as they're all kind of standing at the you know, interspersed behind him and you see the date on it and it says overlook hotel like uh i don't know i think uh oh july 4th ball 1921 mm-hmm Okay, so this is my theory about it. And I, I didn't really have this theory until, you know, having this conversation with you guys, but it all kind of makes sense to me. You know, what does what does the 20s represent, especially individuals who are able to enjoy the 20s as that group of people did in that party, right? In that gold room. We're talking about like a gilded age. We're talking about wealthy people. We're talking about what, you know, I think a lot of um, Americans at that time, like aspired to, to, to be, to live the life of, right? Opulence, mm -hmm. wealth, all of that. And so I feel like it's a representation of what uh, Jack desires and wishes he could be. Like, I think he has in his mind that he has the potential to, to, to be that, to be like, cause in that picture, yeah. that 1920s ball picture, he's like the life of the party. He's in the yeah. center. Everyone loves him. Everyone's having a great time. Like there's a reason why the 1920s is, is, is used in that film the way that it is. I think. He's um, like, an, he's like and, an F Scott Fitzgerald kind of character. Like, you know, yeah. in that, Assumably, I mean, going by this theory, I think you're right. But like, yeah, I think yeah. you're right too. I, this, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, the whole thing when he's the, when he's going through the ballroom and it's full of people, it just feels like giant wish fulfillment. Like this is just his fantasy. This is his way of twisted way of coping with his totally fucked up life that he's not satisfied with. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and I think that he has these moments of realizing that he's he's not living up to what he thinks his potential is. And he uh -huh. lets that frustration and anger out mm -hmm. on his family, mm -hmm. right? So I feel like that image was just a part of his like internal desire, mm -hmm. right? The way that he wishes his life turned out to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. He's, and he's kind of, he's kind of at a crossroads um, 
I mean, living like the American dream, I guess, in the, you know, between like the 40s and 70s, like it, it's kind of like, a, oh, well, anyone can make it into this like middle class kind of thing. Like maybe maybe you're not going to be like the opulent like writer at the party, like, you know, but like anyone can kind of make it into this like, you know, career, like union union job, like, you know, like you probably like it's, it's a pretty likely chance you're going to have a nice life with like a, you know, like a, like a family and you're going to be, you know, in this in this job kind of for like for most of your life and like you know like you're gonna have some comfort and some um like some some i guess uh you know security in that and we're kind of entering when this movie is filmed like like the reagan age of like no you don't fucking have that like this is like the neoliberal age where we're kind of shedding off careers shedding off jobs like people are getting like whole areas are kind of deindustrialized, and less and less people are getting that so that frustration um you know is it, kind of at that crossroads where it's like well he couldn't even make it at the time when everybody was supposed to be making it like how are you supposed to make it uh you know now in this new age where it's even less like like because he's kind of one of those classic i, I wouldn't say drifters but like fuck ups i guess is what i'd say that like mm -hmm. can't like are going like have like is taking their family from town to town not able to hold down a steady career which you know in the 20s was something that was pretty common but you know after that kind of became less so um during like a more 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 widespread age of prosperity right uh, and i mean think about think about how he like signed up for this job in, in this empty hotel during an off season and like won't even do what he agreed to do like he has wendy doing his job for him mm -hmm. in like maintaining the hotel and stuff like there's just a lot of self-hatred um, but also I feel like all of those depictions of like the opulent 1920s is like what he wishes he had. He wishes he had that life. He wishes that he was admired by this massive group of people. He wishes he was the life of the party, but he knows what he is. Uh, he's abusive to his family. He's a fuck up. Uh, he can't even do the very simple job that he agreed to do at this hotel. Um, so it just kind of shows this like juxtaposition between what he desires and what he actually ended up being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he, he likes the idea of uh, of being a writer, but as far as we know, he actually hasn't succeeded in writing anything. Yeah, yeah, right. A sentence. <laughs> one sentence. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> literally one sentence. Yeah, uh, I mean, yeah. I would, and it's a good well, sentence. I mean. <laughs> That's little crazy. derivative yeah that's a callback to earlier yeah. <laughs> well not to be not to be annoying on this but just because uh i'm sure some people who are listening are interested in like psychoanalysis right and when, when you're talking about jack um you know there's the question of like foreclosure right which in like lacanian like psychoanalysis is the idea when you basically are denying like the ego the possibility of something being right so for jack in this movie right what he's denying the ego is the possibility of being the writer because it's, it's very notable that like even though he spends this entire time um trying to write this novel or whatever the idea of him being an author or having a successful novel or anything like that never is experience in his if we're if we're taking a kind of psychoanalysis like psychoanalytic read of like the ghost stories for example right like him being a famous author is not a part of those fantasies at all right mm. so there's very much like this foreclosure of that kind of like realization of his ego fantasy mm -hmm. which um for that kind of like lacani understanding of uh of uh, you know uh, of like psychoanalytic you know experiences like that is the beginning of of psychosis right is when like the ego is denied right when the fantasy is denied when the fantasy becomes impossible that you become psychotic all right well to, yeah. to move away from to move away. psychoanalysis for a moment to go back to marxism mm -hmm. Uh, I think the another the true other, science. <laughs> yeah, probably probably the more venerable tradition of the two, if I had to pick. But uh, no, I agree. <laughs> By the um, way, just for folks, just so people know, like I constantly cons consider myself a recovering like Lacanian. Um, so when I, know, I go through I, these things, it's just like I got these like tools in the back of my pocket. Might as well like flex them when I can. <laughs> yeah, I know. I I really poke the bear. 
pun intended. But um, <laughs> anyways, I uh, with the with the photo at the end, I would just add that I think it's significant that um, seeing Jack in the photo and and this idea that there is uh, a Jack in the past, there's a Jack now that not it doesn't have to necessarily be Jack the human being character that we just watched, but the a, a mm. kind of a Jack, a Jack that continues to keep coming back that there is some kind of structural reproduction of this process that this only happens because they end up in the hotel like that I, I don't think it's just total free agents making the decisions that they're making that there is an interplay between the characters and the space the again if you if you take um if you take the beginning uh, with the interview as uh an indication that jack is being interviewed uh to basically be the caretaker for america with you know, the person who looks kind of like JFK sitting at the, the desk in the beginning. Um, and again, this whole idea that it's built on an Indian burial ground, that there's something structural about our society that keeps creating people like Jack. Um, and so mm -hmm. this story that we just saw is just one of many that will continue to keep happening, that people know these people because they're around us all the time, because that's it's it's not just uh kubrick i think at one point said that he does think that there's an evil part of the human psyche and like i think that's definitely evident insofar as like jack shows up to the hotel already like an abusive father but he nevertheless is also someone who's very aware of how society shapes the individuals individuals within it and, and shapes their choices um so i i do think it matters that like he that someone like jack maybe not you know again if you if you want to take it in this direction it, it might not be the literal person jack that's in the photo but a jack will continue to keep showing up they'll continue to keep fulfilling this role as the the caretaker um the other thing is that this is a real photo that jack is um he is uh airbrushed over someone else uh that some people have found the real photo that the, the guy that he's airbrushed over is really weird looking. Um, but it's, and a lot of the people are kind of lookalikes to various important political and economic elites of the period as well. So there's this whole kind of idea of like, um, you know, uh, the 20th century American empire, that's, you know, largely uh, an economic, economic phenomenon, although obviously not exclusively by any means, but that it's more and more now the the banking elites and, and Wall Street elites that are um, that are you know in control of uh, of America. But anyways, that's all. It's not. I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, also, this movie came out four years after the Eagles Hotel California. You know where you learn that you can check out any time you want. <laughs> oh my God. Surely up in there. The <laughs> most, my most, mind. Uh, the most I need to listen to everything now, Ben. This is all a giant Eagles reference. That's it. The, the, <laughs> most, um, the most the most heavy handed uh scene I've ever I've ever seen is a uh, American horror story, the hotel season, which was like the worst season, I think, of American horror story. The first I couldn't watch past the first episode because they ended it with the actual hotel and the hotel California and they like faded out from there. <laughs> And they're like, you can't, yeah, like, you know, like, it's yeah. the Hotel California. Mm. Well, now I want to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this has been really good. Uh, we're, we're getting up to three hours, 20 minutes. Uh, longer, <laughs> almost uh, almost an hour longer than the actual movie, which is very yeah. impressive. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but thank you guys all so much. Uh, this this was fantastic. Um definitely uh if uh if if kale is ever released on a wednesday again you know definitely want to have this exact group of people back to talk about another movie at some point in the future yeah i love that this was fun yeah yeah kale and anna it was great to meet you uh Forrest so good to meet you david good to see you and you ben too, brother bro. happy birthday happy, happy birthday, birthday ben. Ben. happy birthday ben so <laughs> <laughs> no, we'll spare you the embarrassment for that, but happy birthday, man. We all love you so much. All right. Thanks, brother. <laughs>